The show Bridgerton takes place in 1813 England, and it is engagement season. Every mother in high-class society is getting her daughters ready to present them to the queen, and if the queen gives you a favorable rating, then it'll really benefit you to hook up with an eligible guy. If she kind of dismisses you, that's not a great sign. And this show focuses on two families. There's the Bridgertons, who have seven kids. Their daughters are Hyacinth, Eloise, and Daphne. And Daphne's the one who's going to be presented to the queen. The Bridgerton boys are Antony, Colin, Benedict, and Gregory. And Antony is the oldest. He's also the man of the house after his father passed away. So he's going to be the one to give away Daphne when it comes time for her to marry someone. He also decides who she's going to marry. It will not be her mother, Violet, who simply is preparing her to meet the queen and the parties that follow. Now, their next door neighbors and lifelong friends are the Featheringtons. They're led by their mother, Portia, and there's three daughters, Penelope, Prudence, and Philippa. And in a bold move, she's throwing out all three daughters at once, which is kind of unheard of. You usually kind of wait until one daughter's married off, and then the next one gets presented, and then that gets married off, and so on and so forth. So both families get ready to present their daughters to the queen, and the queen is not impressed at all with the Featherington girls. It doesn't help matters that Prudence actually collapses because her corset is way too tight. But the girl that impresses the queen the most that day is Daphne. The queen actually comes down from her throne and says, Flawless, my dear. So Daphne is now the number one girl in every guy's eye. It doesn't hurt about the fact that she has a high dowry, which if you're not aware, a dowry is the price that a guy will get once he marries a girl from the girl's family. Yeah, it's a mess up society. Now, word of this has gotten to Lady Whistledown, and Whistledown is like an 1800s version of Perez Hilton. Since there's no internet, she doesn't run a blog, but what she does do is post everything in a pamphlet that she initially started handing out for free to get people hooked, but after two weeks, she starts charging. And the pamphlet is all about the season and what's going on in high society, and it's got the whole town kind of a buzz. And in the first pamphlet, she paints the narrative that Daphne was a dark horse, but after the queen gave her nod, She's number one in the pecking order. And at first, the Bridgerton girls kind of dismiss this pamphlet, but after they see that it speaks highly of them, they're all invested in it. On the flip side, Portia Featherington isn't a fan of it because they don't even mention her daughters. And she even hypothesizes that it might be Violet Bridgerton, but everyone kind of dismisses that. The fact is, though, nobody knows who Whistledown is, so it's got everybody guessing. And Portia's friend who is there that day has to tell her, you know, Whistledown is correct. Daphne is quite a catch. But she points out that this could be a good thing. The quicker that Daphne gets married off, the more guys and suitors there will be for the Featherington girls. But the Featherington girls are about to be joined by one of their distant cousins. Her name is Marina, and she's from the country. She lives on a farm, and she has nobody to present her. So Lord Featherington nominated Portia. So Portia kind of feels like this is a charity case. And her friend asks her, are you sure about this? I mean, presenting four girls, but because Marina is a simple farm girl, Portia doesn't see any competition for her Featherington girls. Although she gets a rude awakening when Marina shows up and she is gorgeous. That night, though, everybody gets ready for the first party of the season, which is thrown by a woman named Lady Danbury. And this will be the first party that Antony has to escort Daphne to. It's also the first party since the Whistledown pamphlet came out. So everyone's kind of expecting Daphne to be the belle of the ball. And before the party, he's venting to his mistress, Sienna, who is a soprano in the opera, about how he really doesn't want to go to this party because of the mothers and the dads doing deals. And unfortunately, because his dad is dead, he's going to have to be that guy. Sienna tells him how Daphne is fortunate because not every woman has that kind of protection. But he instinctively shoots back, well, not every woman is a lady, which is pretty insulting to Sienna because she knows that she is a mistress. So he has to walk that statement back pretty quickly. But he heads home and gets ready to the party and everybody heads to Danbury's and it's just as Antony had predicted. The mothers are judging everybody, the dads are trying to make deals, but the party does kind of stop when Antony walks in with Daphne. All eyes are on her. But as they're walking around and potential suitors are walking up to her, Antony is just shooing them away, thinking that none of them are good enough for his sister. I mean, to be honest, he's a pretty big cock block. Now, up in the balcony, Portia Featherington is talking to a few friends, but she's also in the middle of putting down Marina because it's obvious that Marina is more attractive than any of her daughters and no one's really walking up to any of the Featherington girls. And it becomes obvious to everybody in the room that if you're picking either Marina or one of the Featherington girls, you're picking Marina. And that includes Colin Bridgerton. He likes himself some Marina Thompson. Now, a late arrival to the party is the Duke, Simon Bassett. And this guy is the definition of 18th century swag. I mean, he's draped in velvet. It's like his penis showed up two minutes before he did on my TV screen. But he's only in town because his father, who he had a terrible relationship with, recently passed away and he just wanted to finish up some of his affairs. He's related to Lady Danbury, though, and once she invited him to the party, he couldn't really say no. She wasn't accepting that. So he's forced to show up, and as soon as he does, Portia Featherington throws her daughters at him, but he's not interested in them. 
He's not really interested in anybody. He doesn't want to marry anyone. He's just looking for a way to be seen and then get the hell out. Now, he's not the only one looking for an escape because Daphne really wants to get away from Antony. She makes up an excuse that she wants to go get lemonade when she's approached by Lord Burbrook. And this guy looks like a rat. For all my Harry Potter fans out there, he looks like Peter Pettigrew's brother. Not attractive at all. And it's someone that Daphne definitely does not want to talk to, but he's kind of chasing her down as she tries to get away, and she bumps into the Duke. So she quickly asks, who are you? So it looks like they know each other and they're having the conversation. But he's kind of insulted about the fact that she doesn't know who he is. He thinks that this is a ploy by one of the other mothers to just get their daughter in the good graces of him. But that's all cleared up when Antony sees Bassett and calls over for him, because they're old friends from school. So Antony clears up any confusion, hey, this is my sister, but now Daphne knows all about the Duke because she figures, okay, well, if you're friends with my brother, then that tells me all I need to know about you. After they're done talking to Simon Bassett, though, Antony suggests that they head out, which is ridiculous because she hasn't even danced with anybody, and Violet brings that up, but Antony points out, let's keep everybody wanting more. All eyes are on her, so this is a great time to leave, and they do. Now, the next day is calling day. It's the first day where guys can come over to the house and show that they're interested in the girls that they met the previous night. And Daphne is expecting a lot of suitors. After all, all the eyes were on her. But unfortunately, no one really shows up for her. And any guy who does is shown the door pretty quickly by Antony. One guy who gets to stay a little bit longer is Lord Burbrook, who Daphne has no interest in whatsoever. And to the surprise of everybody, the most popular girl ends up being Marina. And you can tell that Portia isn't happy that all these suitors are coming over, not for any of her daughters, but for this farm girl. And word of calling day gets to whistle down. So the next issue of the pamphlet that she puts out, it's all about how maybe, even though the queen gave her her nod, the queen was wrong because everybody had eyes for Marina Thompson. She points out that this is exactly what Portia wanted, the number one girl under her roof. But it's not quite true. Portia did want that, but she wanted it for one of her daughters, not Marina. The pamphlet also reaches Daphne, and she is pissed. She talks to Antony about it, venting to him that Lady Whistledown has declared her basically ineligible, worthy of a simpleton and nobody else. Antony tries to remind her that she's giving a lot of credit to somebody who is hiding behind a pen name. No one knows who this person is. But Daphne doesn't care. She feels like everything that Whistledown has written is true, and it's true because of Antony. The fact is, Antony has scared every available suitor away, and Whistledown is simply reporting it. He points out that he's merely protecting her, but she tells him that he has no idea what it's like to be a woman. Her entire life, she's been raised for this moment. And if she's unable to find a husband, she's basically worthless. The good news for Daffy is the next pamphlet from Whistledown doesn't mention her. It's all about how the Duke is not interested in ever getting married. But now Whistledown has the ire of the Duke. He heads to a boys club and is talking to Antony about it, pissed off because Whistledown basically just gave a challenge to every mother out there. Tame the untamable man. But Antony can't believe that the Duke isn't planning on taking a wife. But the Duke throws it right back at Antony, saying, What about you? You're the oldest son. You're not married. Where exactly is your wife? Or are you planning on marrying that opera singer that you're running around with? Antony, however, points out that he is in possession of something that the Duke is not brothers. So he doesn't have to worry about having kids. He figures his brothers will do it for him. In the next pamphlet from Whistledown, it announces that Colin Bridgerton is going to be awarded the, quote, trophy of Marina Thompson. And jealousy is really getting the better of Portia. She would love to send Marina back to the country where she came from, but she knows that Lord Featherington is never going to allow that. So unfortunately for her, she just has to bite her tongue and deal with it. That night, though, there is another party, and it's actually at the opera, the same opera that Antony's mistress sings at. And Violet escorts Daphne there, where as they're walking in, Lady Danbury calls them over to see the Queen again. And when she's reintroduced to Daphne, she says, oh yes, yeah, she made an impression however fleeting it was. Because the queen is no different from everybody else. She's reading Whistledown as well. So when the show starts, Danbury joins Daphne and Violet in their box, and they're kind of venting about Whistledown, how she's put both their families in a bind, writing about Daphne and the Duke. And that's when the two women start to conspire about the fact that they should hook Daphne and the Duke up. So Violet invites the Duke over for dinner, which Danbury accepts on his behalf. And he goes over, and it's the entire Bridgerton family at one table. They're all having a good time, everybody except for Daphne, who is seated next to the Duke. And he can tell that she's not having a good time. And when he brings it up to her, she basically tells him, oh, I'm not going to sit here and just smile because I'm in your presence. It's not going to happen. And the two start squabbling back and forth about how neither are interested in the other. And Antony can clearly see what his mother was doing. So that night, as he's doing work and his mother comes up to him, he yells at her for trying to set up the Duke with Daphne. During the argument, his father comes up and he says, well, if dad was alive and he knew anything about the Duke, 
He wouldn't want to set up his daughter with him. Daphne deserves better. I know you think you're solving this matter, but you're not. They start arguing about whose responsibility Daphne is, and that's when Violet says, okay, let's talk about responsibility. Tonight, when you leave here, are you going to go to your room, or are you going to go to the apartment across town and be with that soprano mistress that you've been seeing? All while you rely on your brothers to do the job that you cannot. You want to talk about responsibility? What the hell do you know about responsibility? I sit with that girl. Do you know what I see? I see a terrified girl who knows what kind of life she's going to have if you continue to get in her way. And the fact is, if your father was still here... Daphne would have already been set up with somebody. Violet then just drops the mic and walks out. And Anthony did exactly as his mother predicted. He headed to that apartment, hooked up with Sienna, but then in the morning he ends it, and he's not that nice about it. And it completely takes Sienna off guard. Now that morning, another pamphlet comes out, and it's all about the downfall of Daphne Bridgerton. But Daphne has to shake it off because they have to head to a party that night. It's a party that the Featherington girls will also be attending, but they'll be doing so without Portia. Portia is staying home because Marina wasn't feeling good. And she was feeling sick because Marina is probably pregnant. She's been at the house for a month. She hasn't had her period. And once Portia finds out, she rips into Marina. She starts telling her how she should be happy because she can send her back to where she came from. And even goes as far as to ask her, do you even know who the father is? But Marina, to her credit, sticks up for herself. Basically telling Portia, you don't know what it's like. You live in an ivory tower. You're sitting here judging me having no idea what I've been through. But Portia ends up slapping her. Now, the Featherington girls have no idea about Marina. They're actually thrilled that Portia didn't come because they're allowed to wear what they want. And for Penelope, it's this pink dress instead of the normal hideous green-yellow stuff that her mother usually makes her wear. So as she's standing around, up walks Colin Bridgerton, and she's kind of got a schoolgirl crush on him. And she's excited until he asks, do you know where Marina is? So she fills him in. Marina's staying home. She's not feeling well. But as the two are talking, this complete See You Next Tuesday named Cressida shows up. She pours a drink on Penelope, acting like it was an accident. It clearly wasn't. And she's asking Colin if he wants to dance. But since Colin's a stand-up guy, he says, no, actually, I promised my last dance to Penelope and escorts her out on the dance floor where the two have a good time. Now, keep in mind, it's 1813. They're short on entertainment. So the big entertainment at this party is they're turning lights on. Makes you real appreciative that we have Netflix and we live in 2021. But right after they flip the switch, that's when Antony walks up to Daph, letting her know that he's decided she's going to marry Lord Burbick. He tells her how he has no debt, he seems like he's nice to women and animals, and he's also got a pretty decent shot. But Daphne has zero interest in marrying this guy because he literally looks like a ferret. So she walks away because she just wants to be by herself. But Burbick finds her and even brings up about the fact that they're soon to be man and wife. But she turns to him and says... I will never marry you. And the conversation turns contentious with Burbick telling her she doesn't have any options. And he goes to put his hands on her, but she knocks him out. Now the Duke, who also went to the party but also wanted to get away, had seen this all go down and he was actually running in to protect her but found out, yeah, she can protect herself. And as Burbick is lying on the floor unconscious, the Duke says, you can't marry this guy. But she says, well, if I don't find anyone else to propose, then I'm going to have to. Unlike you, I can't just say I don't want to marry. And he mentions how he's surprised that she no longer has a line of suitors. He knows it's because of Whistledown, and he despises her as much as Daphne does at this point. He feels like Whistledown has done a number on both of them. But that's when the Duke realizes that there might be an answer to their issue. He suggests the two act like they're an item. It'll kill two birds with one stone. It'll get the thirsty mothers off of his back. And for the other guys out there, if they think that Daphne is taken, they're going to want her even more. So they head out to the dance floor together, looking like they're madly in love. It gets everybody's eyes on them, and it works. In the next pamphlet from Whistledown, that's all she writes about. In episode two, we get some backstory on why the Duke cannot stand his father. Lord Hastings always wanted a son, and he finally got one in Simon. Lady Danbury was even there because she was best friends with Simon's mom. But Lord Hastings was such a jerk that he didn't even care that his wife had died in childbirth. All he cared about was that he had a son. Although, he quickly turned on him. Because the Duke was slow to learn how to speak. And when he did finally speak, he had a stutter. And this caused Lord Hastings great embarrassment to the point where he actually sent the Duke away. Trying to hide him to hide the embarrassment. Lady Danbury got word about this and went to go check in on the Duke. Feeling like she should do this because she was best friends with the Duke's mom. And the Duke was well aware of why his father didn't want anything to do with him. It was because he had a stutter and couldn't speak. But Lady Danbury vowed to get him to the point where he could speak fluently without a stutter. And she is able to kind of do that around the age of 9 or 10. She brings him back in front of Lord Hastings and says, See, here's your son. He's not dead. 
And the Duke can speak really, really well until the final couple of sentences he stutters once again. And Lord Hastings is so cold that he tells the Duke, you are my greatest failure. Little Simon tells him, you know, I wrote you letters to let you know that I wasn't dead. Did you ever read them? But Lord Hastings tells him, just knowing about the fact that you're going to take over Hastings one day is painful enough. Witnessing it in person, I couldn't bear to do that. So the guy was a complete asshole, but fast forward to when he's on his deathbed, he's completely changed his tune. Simon walks in and he tells him he's so happy that he's going to be taking the Hastings name over. But Simon hasn't forgotten, and right before his father passes away, he gets right next to his ear and tells him, I will never marry, which means I will never have a son, which means that the Hastings name is going to die with me. Now, fast forward to present day where Simon Hastings is simply trying to get the mothers off of his back and he's doing that with Daphne and they're haggling over how many balls they're going to be seen in public with each other. Daphne wanting eight, the Duke wanting four, and they finally settle on six with the Duke having to send her flowers, the expensive kind, just to make it look like this whole charade is real. Her other big concern is the fact that no one can ever know what happened with Lord Burbrook the previous night. She's not embarrassed about the fact that she punched him. She's more worried about her reputation if it's found out that she was with him alone. And the Duke had no intention of revealing that secret, so it should be okay. After the picnic, everybody goes home, and the Bridgertons are kind of just hanging out when Eloise bursts through the door and says, How does a woman become pregnant if she's not married? Because Eloise was on a walk with Penelope when Penelope revealed to Eloise that somebody in their house, she didn't mention Marina, but somebody in her house was pregnant and she wasn't married. And this blew both of their minds. They have no idea how a baby is formed if you're not in a marriage. So Eloise needs to get to the bottom of this science experiment, but that is a conversation that Violet is not ready to have with her. She basically tells her, don't bring it up again. But that's when one of the Bridgerton help comes in the room and says that Daphne has some suitors. And Daphne is thrilled about this, but the other Bridgerton family members are a little puzzled because they can't figure out why Daphne even cares about other suitors when she's got a duke after her. The family still has no idea about her arrangement with Simon, and neither does Lord Burbrook, who arrives at the house along with Antony, and he is pissed off that all of these men have suddenly shown up for the woman that he's planning on marrying. And Antony was completely taken off guard by this as well. He walks into basically a party going on in his house, and Burbrook is sitting there looking like an idiot. Antony tells Burbrook that he has to leave, and Burbrook shoots back, you gave me your word, and Antony tells him, and I plan on keeping it. You're the only one that's proposed, you're the only one I've considered. But right now, you have to leave, along with everybody else. And he kicks everybody out of the house, and then turns his attention to Violet. And Antony and Violet start getting an argument about what he walked into, but Violet gets really annoyed when she finds out that Antony had promised Daphne's hand to Burbrook. Daphne, however, is no longer concerned, saying, I have so many suitors now, Burbrook doesn't even matter. But Antony points out that's exactly what you have. You have suitors. You don't have proposals. You have one proposal, and it's from Burbrook. Violet, however, points out that Daphne is courting a duke, and that's something that Antony is complete denial about. But both women point out that the duke sent her flowers in the morning, the expensive kind. Antony, though, reiterates that the duke is not a serious suitor. He's never going to marry. And that's when Daphne tells him, well, I'm not marrying Burbrook. But Antony tells her that the paperwork is going to be drawn up and she will marry Burbrook. Antony storms out and Daphne's pretty upset, but Violet tries to calm her down saying that as soon as Burbrook sees that the Duke is after her, he's going to have to back off. Antony, though, needs to get some answers and he heads to have a conversation with the Duke and finds him in a boxing ring. And he yells at him for trying to hook up with his sister, asking, did you have any idea she was engaged to be married? And the Duke says, no, I had no clue. And he asks, has the paperwork been drawn up? But Antony says, well, I assure you it's being drawn up. The two get into an argument about whether Burbrook is even worthy of marrying Daphne. And Antony ends up kind of insulting the Duke, saying that, well, at least he knows where Burbrook has been. He hasn't been in whorehouses or any kind of slum that the Duke has been in the last couple years. Antony does feel bad about what he just said, but he tells the Duke, look, you've been a great friend, but this is my sister. I'm not trying to offend you, but family has to come first. Antony then leaves because he has to get ready for a ball that night. It's a ball that pretty much everybody needs to get ready for, including the Duke. But as the women of the Bridgerton household are getting ready, they get word that the Queen has invited Violet for tea in two days. And all of the women are thrilled about this invitation. So they're in a pretty good mood as they head off to the ball, where Antony escorts Daphne in, and the Duke escorts Lady Danbury in. But as soon as the Duke sees Daphne, he doesn't care that her brother is by her side, he asks her to dance. And Antony has no choice but to fall back. The Duke and Daphne start walking around the party together, and she explains how they're going to have to make Burbrook believe that this thing is real, so he backs off. Burbrook has to believe that the Duke is serious about proposing. 
And Burbrook, by the way, is at this party, and he's got eyes on both of them like a hawk. Eventually, though, Antony is able to get the Duke alone and asks him, was I not clear with my message? And Simon tells him, no, you were very clear. You intend for your sister to marry a ferret. But that ferret, i.e. Lord Burbrook, is actually right behind him because he has a private conversation, and I use private very loosely, with Antony. It's one of those conversations where he's having the conversation with Antony, but he really wants the Duke to hear it as well. And he reiterates his intention to marry Daphne. All the while, though, the Duke is throwing subtle jabs at Burbrook, mainly about the fact that he got knocked out by Daphne the previous night. Antony assures Burbrook that he'll, quote, handle the matter, and then he turns to the Duke and says that it's none of his concern. But the Duke tells Antony that Burbrook's character isn't exactly squeaky clean and points out his black eye, telling Antony that he tried something in the previous night with Daphne, but she clocked him. And Antony just turns to Burbrook and tells him, you will never speak to my sister again. Now, Daphne was in the other room, but she could tell a commotion was going on. So she walks in as Antony is walking out and asks, what happened? And Antony says, you don't have to worry about Burbrook. He's not a problem anymore. And you would think that Daphne would be thrilled, but she's not. She walks up to the Duke, knowing that he had a hand in this, and yells at him for interfering. Which is confusing the Duke, because she wanted Burbrook gone, and he just did that. After the party, a very confused Duke is walking home, but he's being followed by Burbrook. And Burbrook pleads the Duke to back off. He says, you don't need her. You're a Duke. I do, though. But Simon is just trying to walk away, and that's when Burbrook just needles him a little too much. He brings up the fact that maybe the Duke wants her because he already had her. And that's when Simon turns to Burbrook and basically tells him, back off. It's a subtle threat, but Burbrook doesn't get the message. He apologizes for what he did the previous night, but tells Simon, you should know all about men who have a lack of judgment. I've heard about your father and what he did once he found out your mother wasn't able to give him the son he always wanted. And that's one line crossed too many for Burbrook, and Simon beats the ever-loving crap out of him. The next day, though, Lady Whistledown puts out yet another pamphlet because the word of the engagement to Burbrook has gotten out after the little show that the Duke, Antony, and Burbrook put on at the party. And this has Daphne really stressed out because the message in the pamphlet is, why would Daphne want Burbrook when she has a duke after her? She has to try to get over in a hurry because she has a picnic to attend to. And at the picnic, Antony comes up and apologizes, having no idea about what happened with Burbrook. But she says, you wouldn't have believed me anyway. You only believed that story when a guy told you about it. You didn't care when I told you that I didn't want to marry Burbrook. That wasn't good enough for you, was it? She then gets up and walks away because the duke has shown up. But as the two are walking around, they see Lord Burbrook and his messed up face coming in hot with a piece of paper and he walks up to Antony and Violet and the rest of the Bridgerton gang and threatens them. That piece of paper in his hand is a marriage license and he tells them that he is to marry Daphne. They are to sign off on it and if they don't he's going to tell everybody that Daphne was alone with him on the dark walk and that won't just mess up Daphne's reputation that'll mess up the entire Bridgerton reputation and none of the Bridgertons believe that anything happened between Daphne and Burbrook so this leaves Antony so pissed off that he wants to challenge Burbrook to a duel which is pretty illegal and Violet tells him you're not doing that and Daphne agrees with her mother saying there's no point of doing that I mean what happens if Burbrook speaks before you're able to shoot him words out he can speak at any moment unfortunately I'm gonna have to marry Burbrook and when she gets home she's depressed and sad and her mother comes to try to comfort her telling her that marriage isn't all about the partner yes that's a big part of it but it's also about the family you have and the house you keep and all of those things can bring you a lot of joy but that doesn't really help Daphne because she saw the relationship that her parents had and the love that they had for each other and she wants that. And marrying Burbrook guarantees that that will never be the case. The two go off to bed and the next day is a huge day for Violet. She's going to tea with the queen. And when she arrives, the queen is banging lines of cocaine in between reading the latest Lady Whistledown pamphlet. But shortly after Violet arrives, the queen calls over one of her servants to get her some more cocaine. And when he leaves the room, the queen tells her that that guy is a huge gossip. If they were to speak freely, it would be all over England by the next day. They then start subtly discussing Daphne's situation with Burbrook. Because the queen wants Daphne to marry a duke. The queen basically gave Daphne her stamp of approval, and she knows that it would also be a really bad look for the queen if Daphne marries Burbrook instead of a duke. It's a huge ego trip, but there's a method behind the queen's madness of inviting her there that day. Because when that guy gets back, Violet notices that he's kind of making a face to the woman that Violet brought. And that's what Violet realizes, that she has to invite Burbrook's mom over. So she does that. And Burbrook's mom is really delusional and pretty rude to Daphne. But she didn't invite Burbrook's mom over to actually have pleasantries with her. She invited her over so that the Bridgerton help could get dirt 
on Burbrook from Burbrook's help. And as soon as Burbrook's mom leaves, she gets the lowdown from the staff that Lord Burbrook had an illegitimate child with one of the help and sent not only the female away, but also the child away, who he's ignored, never paid child support for. And if this word got out, it would be a terrible look. So Violet knows she needs to get that secret out ASAP. Now, they all know that no one's going to believe a woman with this story, but there is one woman who everybody will believe, and it's Lady Whistledown. So they need to have this rumor spread so much that it gets to the ears of Lady Whistledown. And they do that. They start spreading it through all the help. And when the next pamphlet comes out, Lady Whistledown writes about Lord Burbrook's illegitimate child. And that should take care of the Burbrook situation. Because that night, as Violet is kind of soaking in her glory, Antony walks in, letting her know that Burbrook has left town. But he also knows that this isn't a coincidence. He tells his mother, I'll make sure this never happens again. But Violet basically fires him, saying that while society dictates that you be the man of the house and you be in charge, I am fully capable of dealing with Daphne and her future husband. So unfortunately for Antony, he gets let go, which is a good thing because he's been doing a terrible job. Now, the next day, Daphne is thrilled about this news. She's getting ready for a party when Eloise walks in. And Eloise has been kind of conflicted watching her older sister go through this pomp and circumstance. Because Eloise wants more for her life. She wants to go to university, even though women aren't allowed to. She hates the fact that this proposal season is supposed to be the highlight of a woman's life. And while it seems like it's enough for her sister, she definitely wants more. Her sister, though, just wants to find a husband. And when she goes to the ball that night, she's escorted in by the Duke, and they start having a conversation about how to make this charade more believable, which is a trend with them. But the latest idea that Daphne has is that they have to start calling each other by their real name. During this dance, though, they get dangerously close to kissing. I mean, real close. But once the song ends, Daphne gets asked to dance by somebody else, and the Duke falls back. And as he's standing there, Lady Danbury comes up and she can tell that something's wrong with the Duke. And while he denies it, it seems like the Duke is starting to have feelings for Daphne Bridgerton. Now, one person who's been noticeably absent from these parties and these picnics is Marina. And the Featherington girls have found out the reason why she's not going to these parties, the fact that she's pregnant. But Penelope wanted some more information about how somebody has a child out of wedlock, the horror. So she brings Marina some food and asks how it happened. And Marina explains that she fell for a guy at church. They started talking, talking led to food, food led to something, something. And he's all fighting a war, but they stayed in contact through letters. And she's in love with him. So she tells Penelope that the baby was made out of love, which doesn't exactly answer Penelope's question about where babies come from. It's adorable how ignorant she is. But Marina has basically been sequestered. And as she's writing the baby's father a letter, one of the Featherington help comes in to give her food. And she says, are you planning on keeping me here the whole time? But the help basically tells her that you have no one to blame but yourself. In episode three, things are going great for Daphne. She's getting proposed to left and right. She's also shooting them down. And word of this has gotten a Lady Whistledown who writes about it in her latest pamphlet. Whistledown hypothesizes that Daphne isn't interested in anybody else. She's just waiting for the Duke to take the plunge and ask her to marry him. They, however, go out for ice cream and are just kind of reveling in the fact that they've fooled everybody. The ruse is working. When she gets home from this ice cream extravaganza, her mom asks her, have you thought about who you want to dance with tonight? And she starts giving out a couple of names, all of them being lords. And her mom says, well, what about the Duke? But Daphne reminds her mom that the Duke hasn't proposed yet. Her mom tells her that marriage isn't exactly rocket science. You just marry the guy that seems to be your best friend. And while Daphne thinks that's ridiculous, her mom tells her, no, it's that simple. But Daphne isn't the only one who's getting ready for the ball that night. Marina is going to be making her first appearance since she became, quote, sick. Portia wants her out and married ASAP. Because in Portia's mind, she's selling off damaged goods. If she gives Marina away quickly, then when Marina has the baby, whoever marries her is going to think it's his. Penelope, though, wants things to work with Marina and the baby's father, George, who is on the front lines fighting in Spain. They keep waiting for George to write them back, and Marina's getting frustrated that she hasn't received a letter, with Penelope reminding her, you know, he's on the front lines, it might take a little bit for you to get word. But Portia rules that household, so Marina's going to the ball, although when she shows up, she is very, very rude to the first guy that Portia introduces her to, setting the tone that she's not going to follow Portia's rules just because Portia wants her to. Daphne and the Duke, though, head into the ball, and immediately she is met by a lord who asks her to dance, and the Duke plays it off perfectly, acting like he's so jealous. But Daphne dances with a few of the guys there, and none of them really do anything for her. 
And while Daphne is dancing with the other guys, Violet is reminding Lady Danbury that she has to get on the Duke to actually pull the trigger and propose. There is, however, a new player in town. He's a prince from Prussia. And girls are falling over themselves to get to this guy. The first one to actually approach him is Cressida. And from a distance, Daphne and the Duke are making fun of her the entire time, predicting her every move as it happens. The prince, however, is brought over by the queen to meet Daphne, with the queen introducing Daphne as the season's diamond. But when the prince says something that Daphne and the Duke had joked that he would, Daphne cracks up, embarrassing the queen completely. Doesn't really matter, though, because the prince is smitten. At this ball, eventually most of the guys get together and start gambling, and that includes the Duke and Antony. And it seems like the bad blood between Antony and the Duke is gone. The Duke tries to bring it up to him, with Antony telling him, well, you can't be mad at me for questioning your intentions, but the Duke says, no, I can. Yeah, I've done some stupid things in my life, but you know me better than anybody. You know I wouldn't make a fool of your sister. As the two are discussing the Duke's intentions, in walks a bunch of other females, including Sienna. These are basically all of the side chicks. And Antony doesn't really want to run into Sienna, but he does notice that she walks right up to the Duke and starts flirting with him heavily, inviting him to one of her concerts. Although, to the Duke's credit, he never shows up. That night, though, after the party, both Antony and Daphne can't really sleep, and they meet up in the kitchen, where Daphne asks Antony, why won't the Duke marry? Antony doesn't give her the full story, but basically tells her that he never knew his mom, and he barely knew his dad. He grew up a lot different than them. In the 20 years that Antony has known him, he's never really mentioned a family, and that's because the Duke likes to be alone. The next day, a new Lady Whistledown pamphlet comes out, highlighting that Prince Frederick from Prussia is in town looking for a wife. And Prince Frederick, along with everybody else, is going to be at this new art exhibit that's opening. And by everybody else, that includes the Bridgerton family. When they show up, Violet starts pointing out all of the single females for Antony, but he's just not interested. It doesn't take long, though, for Daphne to attract the prince. But Daphne doesn't seem really interested in him, and that's something that he seems to like. The art of the chase. She, however, prefers to leave the prince and go into another room where the Duke is admiring all the art that he and his family had donated to it. This whole room is nothing but his father's artwork. And as the two are staring at one particular painting, which the Duke tells Daphne was his mother's, Daphne starts giving her interpretation of it, and their hands start getting close and close until eventually they're actually holding hands. Although they realize what they're doing and they pull away. They go outside where there's a commotion going on, and that's because Cressida had swooned and fainted and was saved by the prince. And look, there were no Oscars back then, but if there were, Cressida wouldn't have gotten one of those. She would have gotten a Razzie because it's horrible acting. The next day, news of this has gotten a lady whistled down, and she writes about it in her latest pamphlet, highlighting the fact that Cressida has seemingly gotten most of the attention from the prince. But while most people are obsessed with him, one person who is noticeably not is Daphne Bridgerton. And news of this does not sit well with the queen, who basically instructs the prince to go court Daphne because she is the diamond of the year. The prince, however, is under the assumption it's a waste of time because Daphne seems to be really into the duke, and he respects that, but the queen does not. This, however, is kind of a down day for everybody in this society. There's no balls going on. So Daphne decides to spend her day working on a piano tune that she's creating, but this leads to a fight with Eloise, because Eloise still does not understand Daphne, and Daphne doesn't really understand Eloise. Portia Featherington, however, wanted Marina to see how the other side lives. She brings her to the slums, showing her that if she doesn't follow order, this is what she'll become, and more importantly, what her child might have to deal with. Marina tells her, I have a man who loves me, and Portia says, all right, well then where is he? And Marina tells Portia that he's fighting on the front lines for his country. She also tells her that she's written to him many times, love letters, but Portia asks, well, has he written back ever since informing him that he's going to be a dad? And the answer to that is no. Portia tells her that a lot of guys will say things to get in your pants, but when it comes time to actually take care of a child, eh, things kind of change. Shout out to all the single moms out there. She then takes Marina home, but Portia knows that she needs to really get through to her. So she, along with one of the help, forge a letter from George in Spain, sending it to Marina, where George breaks up with Marina, telling her that he wants nothing to do with her whatsoever. It really breaks Marina's heart. And the most unfortunate thing is the fact that she has no idea that it's all a lie. And Portia did this because she's so convinced that this guy is never going to show up for Marina after learning that she's pregnant. She feels like this will be the best way to get Marina to buy into the season. Daphne and the Duke, however, meet up at a park and they start talking about marriage. But the more they talk about it, the more the Duke realizes that Daphne doesn't know anything. And it's not her fault, she just hasn't been told by her mother. The Duke doesn't want to exactly be the person to tell her about the birds and the bees, but Daphne begs him and eventually he gives in. 
And he tells her about what happens between a man and a wife, but he also tells her about, you know, alone time with yourself and your hand, a.k.a. all of high school, college, and my adulthood. And this blows Daphne's mind. She had no idea that you could take your hand and go down there and feel around a little bit, and eventually you feel, you feel real good. So with that planted in her head, she knows what she'll be doing that night. The Duke, however, is picked up by Lady Danbury, who chastises him for dragging his feet with the proposal. Danbury tells the Duke that it's obvious to everybody with two eyes that Prince Frederick is into Daphne. So if the Duke is truly into Daphne, that's fine. Go along with it. But if this is nothing more than just a fling, then the Duke should cut her loose. And she also tells him that if he doesn't, she'll never forgive him. But while Daphne has caught the eye of Prince Frederick, when Daphne gets some one-on-one time with her body that night, it's not Prince Frederick that she thinks about, it's the Duke. And as she's upstairs having her first orgasm, outside, her brother and sister are discussing the sexist society that they currently live in. The next day, when Daphne meets up with the Duke for ice cream, she's in a real good mood, but the Duke is not. The Duke, heeding the advice of Lady Danbury, breaks things off with Daphne, telling her that their mission is accomplished. Daphne has plenty of suitors, and the mothers are currently off the Duke. Daphne, though, can't figure out why he's doing this. She feels like she did something wrong. And the Duke, a lot like his best friend Antony, does not let her down easy, but instead is really rude about it, telling her that they were never friends. She was nothing more than a means to an end. And it upsets her so much that she runs home crying. It upsets him so much that he had to do it that he wants to get the hell out of England ASAP, telling those that work for him to expedite the process of finalizing his father's affairs. The next day, Daphne has to head to a seamstress to get a gown. And at the same seamstress is Cressida and her mother. And Cressida's mother walks up to Violet and kind of thanks her for backing off of the prince because with Daphne out of the way, that leaves Cressida to become a princess. And it's pretty awkward because Cressida's mom admits that while Cressida has the money, Daphne has that face. But the whole conversation can be heard by Daphne. And with just being recently broken up, sort of, Daphne now has revenge in her mind. So she tells the help to prepare that bad bitch gown. That one that's going to get everybody's attention at the ball that night. Now Violet goes to check in on Antony to see if he's going to the ball. And in fact he is. So she hands him a list of potential females that he should be looking at. But he's not interested in any of them. In fact, after seeing Sienna, he went back to the opera to try to apologize and win her back, but she told him no, completely rebuffing his advances. So he's really not in the best mood. But Violet is completely unaware of this. What she is aware of is the fact that Antony doesn't have a lot of time. Now, another female who's looking to be on the revenge tour is Marina, who thinks that her baby's father had just up and dumped her. So when she arrives at the ball that day, she's willing to dance with just about anybody. The Duke has also arrived at the ball, but he alerts Lady Danbury that he's going to be leaving England immediately. And because of this, Danbury calls him a fool. And he looks even more foolish when Daphne shows up. Because the gown, the ball, everything works. The entire party stops for her. And when she makes it downstairs, the prince leaves Cressida's side and tells Daphne, I must be your first dance. And she accepts. And as the two are dancing, the Duke can't watch anymore. He just leaves. And in the next whistle-down pamphlet, she wonders if this was simply Daphne sick of waiting for a proposal from the Duke or Daphne leveling up because a prince is better than a Duke. In episode four at the next High Society event, Daphne and her mother meet up with the queen and the prince at this big party. And at the party, the prince gives Daphne a necklace, but as he's putting it on her, all she can think about is the Duke putting it on her. It's obvious, though, to everybody watching that the two are smitting. And in the next pamphlet, Lady Whistledown writes about the leveling up that Daphne has done. It's kind of unheard of to go from possibly marrying a duke to now possibly marrying a prince. And everybody is waiting for the prince to propose to Daphne, including her own family, which is stressing Daphne out. Because while she likes the prince, she wants the duke. Now, some people that weren't at this party to see Daphne get the necklace were the Featheringtons. Portia had invited a lord over to meet with Marina, and this guy is decrepit and old and disgusting. And as soon as he leaves, Marina turns to Portia and says, you can't possibly expect me to marry that guy. I mean, this is ridiculous. I have suitors now. And Portia says, yes, you have suitors. They're just that. They could take months to court you. This old guy, he just wants an heir. He's not going to ask any questions once your little bun comes out of the oven. And this cold realization pisses off Marina so much that she just gets up and leaves. Shortly after she leaves, though, a possible suitor comes courting, but he doesn't come for Marina, he comes for Philippa. And this is the first guy to come calling for one of the Featherington daughters, which has Portia over the moon. But the guy wasn't there with Penelope, so she leaves for the day. 
meeting up with Eloise. Eloise also didn't want to be in her house because she's sick of the whole Daphne circus. She tells Penelope that she hopes that Daphne stays on the shelf forever because once Daphne gets married off, she's next in line and she has bigger aspirations. She doesn't want her whole life to be marriage. She's envious of a person like Lady Whistledown, a woman who's in power, taking all of the town's money and doing it her own way. And that's when she realizes that she has to find out who this woman is. And that's not really Penelope's thing, but she does wish Eloise luck in finding out the true identity of Lady Whistledown. Now, most of the town that day is going to a boxing match that's going to be featuring Will, the Duke's boxing partner. And the Duke was planning on leaving that day, but Will begged him to stay. Because everybody knows that Will and the Duke are close. And if the Duke was absent from this match, then nobody was going to bet on Will. So he needed the Duke there to kind of convince the betting public that Will was the one to bet on. Another person that's going to that fight is Daphne. She was escorted there by Antony. And at the fight, she meets up with the prince, who's a little surprised to see her there. He did ask Antony to bring her, but he never actually expected her to show up because it's just not the sort of thing that girls are usually into. But he's pleasantly surprised. He figured that this would be a good opportunity to get to know each other a little bit more. And Daphne's all for hanging out with the prince, but she does get distracted when she sees the duke. The duke, by the way, also gets distracted when he sees Daphne. But Daphne realized that she needs to get her head away from the duke and back on the prince, so they start having a conversation about how important family is to one another. And the prince seems like a really good guy in the sense that he's interested in what Daphne wants for her life, where Daphne wants to live, what kind of family Daphne wants. And it's worth mentioning that during this conversation, the fight is going on, and the duke is acting as the corner man for Will, but he kind of gets distracted when he sees Daphne and the prince chatting it up. And this conversation went so well between Daphne and the prince that she ends up standing up and cheering for the guy that Will is fighting because he happens to be a friend of the prince, although it doesn't go his way. It's rocky at first for Will, but he ends up knocking the guy out, and he was a big underdog. So there were a couple of angry bettors in the crowd that day, one of them being Lord Featherington. And a bunch of people that did bet on Will come to Featherington looking for their money, and he assures them that he has it, but he needs two days to get his affairs in order. Also at the fight that day was Benedict Bridgerton, and he sees a local artist named Henry Granville, and the first encounter between these two was a little awkward because Benedict was crapping all over Granville's art, unaware of the fact that Granville was standing right next to him, although Granville takes it in stride, he actually found the encounter pretty funny, and invites a very embarrassed Benedict to come to his house later that night and see the other side of his artwork, the less dreary and drab side, and since Benedict is an aspiring artist, he accepts. And then finally, over in the corner is Antony, who is apologizing to the Duke. He tells him that at this point, it's clear that his intentions with Daphne were in fact honorable, and he's sorry he ever felt otherwise. But as the two are having a conversation, the prince ends up walking up to Antony and asking if he could ask Daphne to marry him. Antony, though, doesn't want to give him an answer. He wants to talk to Daphne about it. So he runs home and gives her the good news, although Daphne doesn't really have an answer. She's at a loss for words. And Violet lets her know that she doesn't have to decide right now because of the fact that they don't really know each other yet. And it's a good point. So Antony tells her, hey, when you have an answer, let me know and I'll forward it on to the prince. The fact, though, that she was really hesitant to jump at this has Violet thinking. And that night, as Daphne is getting ready for yet another ball, Violet approaches her and asks what exactly happened with the Duke. And that's when Daphne finally admits that everything her mom saw was a lie. This completely takes Violet off guard, and Daphne tells her, you should be happy. I mean, our plan worked. I've got the eye of a prince. But that's not what Violet wanted at all, telling her daughter, what I wanted was for you to be happy, not your social class to improve. And it's clear that what I saw with the Duke and you, but Daphne cuts her off screaming, what you saw wasn't real. But this is more Daphne trying to convince herself than convince her mother. Violet, though, wasn't the only one that was wondering what the hell happened with Daphne and the Duke. Lady Danbury was wondering the same thing. And as the Duke's things are being packed up, Danbury has a conversation with him where she yells at him for letting Daphne slip through his fingers. She says, I know you don't believe in love, but look how much it's done for our culture. The queen is black, and when the king fell in love with her and married her, it opened all doors, because until that moment, it was two separate societies, white and black. But once the unity was formed, it's like a whole different world was opened up. And that is because love conquers all. But even after this impassioned speech, the duke doesn't believe any of it, saying that love changes nothing. The Duke, though, has a boat to get ready to catch, and Danbury has that ball, where basically the entire town is there. Marina has that creepy old guy on her. Philippa is dancing with her suitor. 
Daphne, though, is waiting for the prince, and as she's waiting for him to arrive, Cressida walks up and confronts her about the fact that she stole the prince from her, saying, you could have had any guy you wanted, why did you have to take the guy that was into me? But Daphne tells her, tough cookies, he chose me, I don't know what to tell you, and then walks up to the prince who had just arrived, and the two start dancing. And the party seems to be going well for everybody except Philippa, who runs up to her mother crying because her suitor won't even look at her anymore. Lord Featherington had said something to him to scare him off. And this mortifies Portia, who walks up to Lord Featherington demanding to know what the hell he said. Because, in her eyes, that suitor was perfectly fine for Philippa. Combining this with the fact that she doesn't have any other suitors, but Lord Featherington tells her that he's fine if none of them marry this year. They all wait. And then he just walks off. The party is also not going great for Marina, who is still dancing with a corpse. And she's rescued by Colin Bridgerton, who couldn't believe that she actually wanted to dance with that guy. He walked up to Penelope to confirm the fact that she wasn't actually into him. And when Penelope said, no, she actually needs to be saved, Colin Bridgerton came to the rescue and saved her. And Marina has a lot more fun dancing with Colin than she did with an 85-year-old. Daphne and the prince, though, continue to dance the night away, but he gets that important moment where he's going to propose to her, and she gets so freaked out that she excuses herself, running outside to get some air, and also ripping off the necklace that he gave her. And that's when she hears somebody call her name from behind her, and it's the Duke. The Duke was planning on leaving that night, but he stopped by to say goodbye to her. And she tells him, there's no need, we're not friends, remember? And he apologizes for all of that, but she doesn't want to hear it. She starts telling him how good she's doing because Prince Friedrich is ready to propose to her. And she starts going through all the reasons why Prince Friedrich is great for her. But the Duke isn't buying anything that she's selling. She's getting more and more animated, though, saying how great her life's going to be. But it seems like she's convincing herself more than she's convincing the Duke. And she gets really upset with the fact that the Duke isn't responding to any of this. So she just starts to walk away and the Duke chases after her. But she's unknowingly running into the dark walk. Eventually, the Duke catches up with her, spins her around, and then he kisses her. And the two start heavily making out with some sweet second base action over the shirt. But then they're caught by Antony, who has the bold strategy of throwing the Duke down, punching him in the face, and then demanding that the Duke marry Daphne. He tells the Duke, you just took her innocence. Let's pray to God that nobody saw this, but you now have to marry her. The Duke, however, sticks to his pledge to not wed, apologizing to Daphne, but saying... I'm sorry, I can't. And Antony can't believe that he quote-unquote took her innocence, and now he won't even do the honorable thing and marry her, that he demands to have a duel with the Duke at dawn. And it's not just Antony who's insulted at this point. Daphne's pretty insulted too. The way she views it, the Duke would rather die than marry her. And all the Duke can say for himself is, I'm sorry. So Antony escorts Daphne back into the party where it's clear something had happened. And Cressida walks up to her and says, Daphne, you look unwell. Did you catch a chill in the garden? Kind of hinting to Daphne that she might have seen what went down. Antony, though, comes to the rescue and escorts her home for the night. And when the two get home, they have an argument about Antony's true intentions with this whole duel situation because Daphne takes a lot of responsibility for what happened in the garden. She reminds him that dueling is very illegal, and Antony says, I don't take this lightly, but this is the way gentlemen handle things like this. It's not just your honor at stake. If any of this were to get out, it's our family name. And Daphne is struggling with the fact that her brother could die or the Duke could die, and it's all because of her. The conversation, though, is interrupted when Benedict gets home from a night at Granville's house with a lot of like-minded individuals. It was the first time that Benedict was able to kind of let his hair down and just be an artist for once. So he's in a pretty good mood until he interrupts the conversation and Antony pulls him into another room and explains what's going on. And this has a pretty big effect on Benedict because he's next in line. So if Antony dies, Benedict is now the man of the house. And if Antony survives, well, dueling's pretty illegal, so Antony's going to have to flee the country. So Benedict is going to have to take over the family affairs. They also fill Colin Bridgerton on what's going on as well when he arrives home. Knowing, though, that this is going to be the last night in his house, Antony goes to visit Sienna. And at first, Sienna does not want to talk to him at all, but he explains the situation and tells her that if he survives, he's going to have to flee the country, and he wants her to come with him. And she likes that offer so much that the two end up having sex. It's pretty great. So it was a pretty busy night at the Bridgerton household. It was also a pretty busy night at the Featherington household as well. Lord Featherington scaring off a perfectly good guy for his daughter has really piqued the interest of Portia, so much so that she goes into his office looking for the reason why, and she finds it. And when Featherington arrives home that day, she confronts him with his ledgers. She's found all of his debts, all of his gambling history, 
everybody that he owes money to, including Marina's father, which explains why he's so hesitant to return Marina back where she came from. And the reason why he scared this guy off is because he also gambled away the dowries. So he can't pay this guy to take his daughter. And Portia demands to know how he plans on fixing it, but all he can do is break down, crying in her shoulders, saying how much he failed the family. It's not all tears, however, in the Featherington household, because in the other room, Marina is over the moon in love with Colin. And she's telling Penelope this, unaware that Penelope is also pretty in love with the guy. She's convinced that Colin is going to propose very soon, and Penelope is doing her best to hide her emotions, but she just doesn't want to hear it. And Marina isn't really picking up on that. Marina does eventually leave thinking that Penelope's going to go to bed, but Penelope notices somebody outside, and that's Eloise. So she goes down to see what she wants, and Eloise is blabbering on about her theories on who Whistledown could be. She thought it would be a houseworker, but she found out the hard way that, yeah, that's not true. So she now figures that Whistledown has to be a high society widow because of the fact that she's invited to all these parties, but she's not important enough to be noticed. And this conversation is stressing Penelope out so much that she loses it on Eloise, yelling, I don't care. Some people have real problems, and I don't expect you to understand because not everybody can be a pretty Bridgerton girl. And Eloise is so aghast that she just walks off. So it was a pretty tense night for a lot of people. The next morning, though, is the duel, and Daphne could not sleep. She goes to Colin demanding to know where this duel is taking place because she wants to stop it from happening. And Colin is reluctant to tell her. He also figures that the duel won't actually take place, that both guys will realize the whole thing is stupid, and they'll fire off their pistols into the sky. Daphne, though, disagrees, telling Colin that Antony is too angry to fire wide and the Duke is too stubborn. So Colin gives her the location and she races off to try and stop it before it starts. Antony and Benedict have arrived, however, and so has the Duke and Will. And right before they're to grab their pistols, Antony tells Benedict that if things don't go his way, there's a name of a woman in the top drawer of his desk and she is to be taken care of. And that woman, of course, is Sienna. The two men, though, go, they grab their pistols, they take their paces, and then they turn around a point. And Antony has got his pistol pointed right at the Duke. He's planning on firing it. But the Duke has his pistol pointed in the sky. He has no plans on killing his friend. And right as Antony fires his gun, Daphne arrives. But when the gun goes off, the horse that she's on throws her back. And immediately both men go to tend to Daphne to make sure she's okay. And she's okay, but she's pissed off that it actually came to this. She demands to talk to the Duke privately. And she explains to the Duke that Cressida had seen the two in the garden. And Cressida is going to talk. And once she does, this will ruin Daphne's reputation. So if the Duke doesn't marry her, her life is basically ruined. The Duke, however, reiterates that he cannot marry her. And she is floored that after explaining the situation, he still won't marry her. And that's when the Duke explains that if they were ever to wed, he could not give her a child. He knows that all she wants is to have a family and to have a household and to have the love that she grew up with. And by marrying her, he would be asking her to sacrifice all of that. And he doesn't want to make her give up her dream. She, however, thinks about it for a couple seconds and then proclaims to everybody that her and the Duke are to be wet. And in episode five, we're getting ready for a wedding. Now, Violet's feeling under the weather, a.k.a. she's got a hangover, but she suddenly feels a lot better when Daphne comes in and lets her know that she's engaged and she's engaged to the Duke. She's a little surprised, however, that it wasn't the prince because all roads pointed to Prince Friedrich. She's even more surprised because it doesn't seem like Daphne's all that excited about this. But Daphne says, no, I'm excited. I just haven't had a moment to really take it all in. She does tell her mother she doesn't feel like waiting a month to get married and says, isn't there a way that we can get a license quicker than that? But she also realizes asking that is kind of fishy. So she tells her mom, I don't want to lie to you, me and the Duke, but Violet cuts her off saying, you don't have to tell me what happened between you and the Duke. Even though society makes a big fuss about things, it's tough to keep your emotions in check when you want somebody. So they will attempt to get a marriage license quicker than what's normally expected. And with not a lot of time, they have to go into wedding mode ASAP. Because they don't want this thing to look like a kid's birthday party at a roller rink. Crappy pizza, store-bought cake. They want it to look legit. But in the next pamphlet, word of the engagement comes out, and Lady Whistledown writes about it, which catches everybody, including the Queen and Friedrich, by complete surprise. Whistledown speculates that the only reason you'd want a marriage license quicker than a month is if you're truly madly in love or... You're hiding something. Friedrich, on the other hand, wants to get some kind of clarity. So he heads over to meet with Daphne, and she apologizes for everything that's gone on. 
telling him that while she likes him and he's an incredible guy, she's just in love with the Duke. There was really nothing that Friedrich could have done. And to his credit, Friedrich just accepts this, wishing her and the Duke nothing but the best. She then heads to the park where, along with Violet and Lady Danbury, they meet up with the Duke. And the Duke is hung over. Daphne and the Duke walk off alone together, and Daphne's trying to make conversation, but the Duke isn't really giving anything back. It's pretty awkward. Now, while his sister and his friend slash dual mate were having awkward walks in the park, Anthony went to go visit Serena, only to find out that she's not there. The seamstress, who's Serena's friend, lets him know that she skipped town. And Anthony headed over there to make good on his promise that he would take care of her, but the seamstress tells him, you know, this could come as a surprise. She doesn't need your money. Anthony Bridgerton is not the only Bridgerton that the seamstress could see that day because there's a dress fitting for Daphne. But as they're talking about what she'll wear on her wedding night, in walks Cressida. She gets Cressida alone to try to find out how much information Cressida did know. And Cressida does kind of poke at Daphne taking a midnight stroll in the garden. And at first, Daphne says, there's no way you could have seen anything from the balcony. Either that or you were also in the midnight garden. But when Cressida tells her that her view was perfectly fine from the balcony, she just played around with the prince to rile up the duke, then lure him in the gardens to trick him into marrying her. That's like a final straw for Daphne. She tells Cressida, you know, you should be more careful with your words because in a couple days I'm going to be a duchess and you, well, you'll just be the same old person. Unmarried, untitled. So you can either be a duchess's friend or an enemy. It's up to you. Cressida, though, doesn't back down saying... That she doubts that Daphne will even get him down the aisle in the first place because she imagines a guy like the Duke doesn't appreciate being tricked into marriage. Now, while Daphne was dress shopping, the Duke and Antony headed to the church to get the approval for the marriage license. The Duke tells Antony he has no interest whatsoever in the dowry. He's not taking it. He's planning on marrying Daphne because it's the right thing to do. They also have a conversation about the whole, hey, I tried to kill you yesterday thing, saying, ah, we'll probably laugh about this later. But there's no laughing when the priest comes in and denies their request for a marriage license. And it all has to do with the queen. The queen does not like the fact that her nephew, the prince, is heading home to Prussia without the diamond of the season. She's even more upset because Friedrich doesn't even plan on fighting for Daphne. So the queen intervened, telling the priest not to accept the marriage license. So Antony and the Duke head over to let Danbury, Violet, and Daphne know that their request was denied. And Danbury knows exactly what happened. She can put the pieces together. And she points out that if this really pissed off the queen, it doesn't only bode well for Daphne's social future, it doesn't bode well for any Bridgerton social future. But there is a way to possibly smooth things over. Danbury says that they should appear in front of the queen and plead their case, telling the queen that they're in love. Don't put it on thick because she'll realize what's going on, but do it just enough to make it believable. So the Duke and Daphne know what they'll be doing the next day. That night, however, Benedict Bridgerton goes back to Granville's place for a party. Or I should say it's more like an orgy. He starts off hooking up with the seamstress, which is a good choice because she's a dime. The seamstress leads him over to have a threesome with another chick. But as they were trying to find a room, they did open a door to find Granville hooking up with a dude. I mean, all bets were off at this party. Now, the Duke had himself quite a night. He went on yet another bender, only to be saved by Will, who brought him back to his place to sober up. And it was even an active night for the Queen. She finds out that the King is up and alert. And this is a surprise because rumors have been swirling that the King was on his deathbed. But he's eating dinner, things have been going great, until he asks to see his child, his child who passed away. He had completely forgotten that she died, and he starts to blame the Queen for this. Losing his cool, freaking out, It's a really, really sad state. The next day, though, the Duke sobers up, meets up with Daphne, Violet, and Danbury at the castle where they are to plead their case in front of the Queen. And it's worth noting that the Queen actually, she had no hand whatsoever in denying their marriage request. But she still tells them to go ahead, plead their case. Daphne's the first one to speak, saying that while she's flattered by Friedrich, it was love at first sight. But the Duke jumps in saying it was not love at first sight. It takes everybody a little bit by surprise because no one knows exactly what he's doing, but he tells the queen that there was attraction, sure, but at first, Daphne thought he was arrogant and insincere, and he thought of her as immature. It seemed like romance was entirely out of the question. But the more they spent time together, the more they became friends. This was all happening while they were fooling everybody into thinking that they were courting, when in reality, they just couldn't stand not spending time together. He's never been one to chit-chat, but with Daphne, conversation was easy. 
And it wasn't until the prince came around when he realized that he didn't want Daphne just to be a friend. He wanted her to be his wife. Uh, it's a beautiful speech. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not really an emotional guy, but it even got me. It definitely got Daphne. And it even gets the queen because she reverses course and allows them to marry. And in front of a very small ceremony that includes Daphne's family, Lady Danbury, Will, the Duke, and Daphne become man and wife. Afterwards, they have the reception where Cressida walks up to Daphne and refers to them as friends, telling her she hopes that she'll remember her kindness in keeping secrets. Also at the reception are the Featheringtons, and Marina still wants to marry Colin. Portia, on the other hand, wants her to marry that old guy, but Marina has come up with a plan. She tells Portia, give me a couple days to court Colin and get a marriage proposal. And when Portia points out that even if he does propose, it's going to take months for them to marry. By that time, this kid comes out. It's going to be obvious to Colin that it's not his. Marina tells Portia, well, we don't have to wait for marriage because that little vixen is planning on seducing Colin. Getting in his pants early, it'll kill two birds with one stone, it'll force Colin to marry her, and he will believe it's his child. This is really upsetting to Penelope. Nobody seems to listen to her that Marina and Colin shouldn't be together. It's partly because she's friends with Colin, but partly because she has a giant crush on him. So at the reception, Penelope is pointing out all these guys to Marina that she could end up getting with, but Marina's only concern is where is Colin Bridgerton? And it gets to the point where Penelope says, anybody but Colin. He's my friend, he's a good man, and he shouldn't be tricked into your plot. And Marina gets really upset, saying, well, should I just entrap a bad guy then? Would you find it acceptable if I was to live my life with a guy who didn't treat me as a human being? I mean, what exactly am I supposed to do? I'll be a good wife to Colin. He'll be a good father. The conversation, though, is broken up when Portia comes over and lets Marina know that the old guy is off the table. He's engaged to somebody. And Portia tells Marina, your little plan better work. And at that moment, Marina sees Colin, so she springs into action. She gets Colin alone in the library, noting that they shouldn't be there alone. And she does try to seduce him, but Colin isn't the hit it and quit it type. He actually rejects her advances, saying how difficult it is, but then he does pop the question. Unfortunately for Marina, he wants a big wedding. He wants time to plan. He wants time for their families to get there. It's time that Marina doesn't have. Colin also points out that they shouldn't say anything about the engagement, mainly because it's Daphne's day. They don't want to overshadow it. But outside in the reception, all the heavy hitters in town are there, including the queen. The queen overhears Eloise asking Lady Danbury if she's Lady Whistledown. And Danbury says, no, but hey, let me know if you find out who she is. And when the queen overhears Eloise talking about her, the queen wants to know exactly what evidence Eloise has. So Eloise tells her her theory that Lady Whistledown must be a widow. Also at the party is Granville and Benedict. And Granville starts saying, hey, about last night. But Benedict cuts in and says, what do you mean about last night? So Granville's secret is safe with Benedict. Although he is pretty surprised when Granville introduces Benedict to his wife. And his wife is the other woman that Benedict had a threesome with. But we don't lifestyle shame on this YouTube channel. The party, though, is getting to be a lot for Daphne. She runs up to her bedroom to hide where Violet comes and finds her. And Violet tries to have the conversations about what goes on wedding night. I'm talking about the sex stuff. Because Daphne has no idea about anything. And Violet is doing her best to keep it PG, but she's not giving her enough information, so Daphne's in for quite a surprise. She does, however, have to get ready to go, because her and the Duke are headed back to the Duke's place. It's quite a journey, but she says goodbye to her family, including Eloise, who she's never had a great relationship with, but she does love her. She's her sister. But after they get in the carriage to take off, the Duke lets her know that they're going to be spending their wedding night at an inn, because his house is too far away for them to go there in one shot. And it's not exactly what Daphne had planned for her wedding night, but she keeps her mouth shut. When they do arrive at the inn, however, she's upset when she finds out that the Duke had asked for separate rooms. Once again, though, she keeps her mouth shut. But as she's pacing in the room, she finally gets sick of it, holding it all in. She opens the door to go talk to the Duke, but the Duke is actually standing there wanting to know if she wants to go get dinner. And that's when all of her raw emotion lets out. She yells at him that she doesn't want to get dinner because she spent the last three days trying to talk to him. And she understands that he doesn't want to be with her. He'd rather be in his separate room, enjoy a wordless dinner. But this whole thing is a complete misunderstanding between the two. And after they talk it out, the Duke isn't mad at her at all. He just feels really guilty about the fact that he's keeping her from her dream, having a family. The Duke tells Daphne, everything I told the Queen was true. I can't stop thinking about you. I am yours, Daphne. But Daphne isn't really getting the message, and that frustrates the Duke, 
And Daphne thinks that he's angry, but he says, no, I'm not angry. This is what happens when somebody burns for someone. And he thinks that Daphne doesn't burn for him, but it turns out that Daphne does, in fact, burn for him. The two then start to kiss. The Duke starts peeling off her clothing. He eventually takes his pants off and shows her his lap snake, and the two consummate the thing. And it seems like she's having a good time, and it's worth noting that the Duke's pullout game is a 10 out of 10. In episode 6 with Daphne gone away with the Duke, Colin feels like this will be a good time to alert everybody to his engagement to Marina. So he makes that announcement at a party, which takes everybody by surprise, including his family. Antony walks up to Violet and says, did you have any idea about this? But she knows people are watching, so she doesn't want to act appalled. But the Bridgertons aren't the only ones who are a little bit perturbed by this, because Penelope is definitely pissed off. And when Antony gets Colin alone, he rips into him, saying, you barely know this girl. Antony asks him, did you do anything with her? I mean, is there a reason behind this? But Colin says, no, I'm doing this for love. Antony blames himself, saying, I should have taken you to brothels when you got back to school. This is what happens when you don't sow your wild oats, a.k.a. slutted up around town. He feels like Colin is just marrying the first chick who will sleep with him. And Colin feels like he's hearing way too much from a guy who's scared to marry. The next day when Colin gets up, he is greeted at breakfast by a very awkward interaction with his family. The only one who's excited for him is Hyacinth, and that's only because the engagement has made the latest pamphlet from Whistledown. Colin knows he needs to talk to his mother alone to find out her true feelings about this, and it doesn't seem like Violet is very pleased. He tells her, you know, I've been courting Marina all season. Maybe you didn't notice because you were so busy with Daphne. Violet says she noticed him flirting with Marina, but he flirts with a lot of girls. And since she doesn't want to rain on his parade, she just says that everything's happening so fast and she wasn't prepared to have two children fly the nest in one season. So Violet is taking the PC approach. Penelope is not. When she walks in and sees Marina, she is rude as hell to her, trying to give her the silent treatment. Even as Marina explains to Penelope how important it is for her to have Penelope on her side because she was the first really nice person she met, Penelope just feels like she's kissing her ass. She does tell Marina, I'm never going to bring scandal on this family or your name, but you need to know I don't approve of this relationship. Marina, though, needs to head off to the Modiste to get a wedding dress. And at the Modiste, she runs into Lady Bridgerton and Eloise. Violet tells Marina, do not call me Lady Bridgerton. You must call me Violet now. Our families are to be entwined. Portia invites Violet over to dinner the next night so they can celebrate. And then she goes to have a conversation with the Modiste about the bill that they have. The outstanding balance is so much that the Featheringtons aren't allowed to actually buy new dresses for their daughters. And since Lord Featherington has no money, this becomes an issue. Portia thought that the Modiste would let it slide because of the fact that Marina is getting married. And not only is she getting married, she's getting married to a Bridgerton. But the seamstress isn't willing to let that slide. And as she's telling Portia, maybe you need to find another seamstress in that thick French accent, Marina calls her out on it because Marina's mother is from France. And she starts speaking to the modiste in French, telling her how she's not fooled by her little act. She doesn't believe the modiste is French. This really shouldn't be a big deal because the modiste does good work. Everybody goes to her. But when you're selling French fashion and you're not actually French, it becomes an issue. And to keep Marina's mouth shut, the modiste agrees to make the dress. The next day, all of the Featheringtons are heading over to the Bridgerton household for dinner to celebrate, and Portia tells Marina that she will bring up the matter of having a quick wedding. But Penelope is done hiding behind the mask of politeness, and she's flat out telling people, yeah, this isn't going to work. Lady Bridgerton is smart. She's had eight kids. She's going to know when she's being played. But the Featheringtons don't really have another option, so they go along with it. During the dinner, Portia does bring up that she thinks that they should marry sooner rather than later, but Antony says no. Colin's way too young. I think a lengthier engagement would be more appropriate. And after dinner, as one of the Featheringtons is punishing the group with her horrible singing, Penelope gets Colin alone and tells him that Marina is still in love with somebody else, a guy named George. She's seen the love letters and she's still in love with him. But Colin is unfazed by this, mentioning how he's flirted and had crushes with just about every girl in town. And if Marina is so in love with George, then why is she marrying me? Marina, though, comes out and sees the interaction going down and tells Penelope that Portia wants to have a word with her. She then gets Colin's undivided attention and says how she can't take this anymore. Her own family doesn't want her, the Featheringtons don't want her, and it's obvious that Violet disapproves of the relationship. 
Colin cuts her off and says, that's not true. I'm your family now. And Marina tells him, that's all I want. I just wish that we could be married right this second. And that's when Colin brings up the one way that they can get married. Heading over to Scotland. He knows that Antony will be pissed off when they arrive back, but at that point it's too late. They're married. Marina tells him she loves the idea and Colin says, okay, give me a day to arrange everything. So these two lovebirds are doing the 1800s version of flying off to Vegas and getting married in front of Elvis. But Penelope is not done giving up hope that she can break this relationship up. She goes through Marina's things and finds the love letters and notices that there's something up with them. Mainly that the signature from George does not match up. And when Marina walks in the room, initially she's pissed off that Penelope is holding her things, but Penelope excitedly says, no, you don't understand. George didn't write these letters. My mother did. George never said those horrible things to you. And Penelope is convinced that this will change Marina's mind, but it doesn't. Because Marina says, well, it doesn't matter anyway. He still hasn't written back to me. He's abandoned me. And Penelope is getting more and more upset about this. And she asks Marina, what are you going to do when Colin discovers that the child is not his? He's not an idiot. And Marina tells her that she'll live safe in the knowledge that her husband is a good and kind man. Expecting Colin just to accept the child as his own. But Marina also realizes that Penelope is way too invested in this and tells her, you love Colin Bridgerton. That's the only reason why all of this makes sense. And Penelope tries to play it off like that's not the case, but Marina gives her a cold dose of reality that Colin will always view Penelope as a sister, whereas he will view Marina as a wife, and it will never change. And with nowhere else to turn, Penelope that night heads back to her old friend Eloise's arms. Even though they were fighting, they're still really good friends deep down, and Eloise tries to comfort Penelope as she's bawling her eyes out, knowing that Colin is making this big mistake getting tricked. But before Colin and Marina can head off to Scotland to get married, Lady Whistledown has gotten word that Marina is tricking him. And she writes about it in the latest pamphlet, which puts a kibosh on the whole thing. It makes the Featheringtons look really, really bad. Now, over with Daphne and the Duke, they arrive at the Duke's place, a place called Cliveden, a massive mansion, and they're greeted by the staff that includes sort of the house manager, a woman named Mrs. Coulson. And they quickly christen the bedroom, but one of the staffers walks in after they finish, of course, he's not rude, and tells the Duke that while he knows he's on his honeymoon, the affairs are a mess. There's also a ton of letters from farmers begging for an audience with the Duke. The Duke hasn't been there in a while, and in his absence, things are all a mess. So while the Duke is attending to, I guess, his job, Daphne is walking around the castle with Mrs. Coulson, and she's kind of being a know-it-all with things, pointing things out that she wants to change. You can tell that it's irking Mrs. Coulson, but she's polite enough not to say anything. But they are on their honeymoon, so they bang all over the place. I mean, outside, inside, table, bed, doesn't matter. And it's so adorable because as Daphne is talking to her lady's maid, she tells her that she didn't even know it was possible for the Duke to have sex because of the fact that he said he couldn't have children. And it's so laughable because the Duke's thrust game is at a 100. They do take a break from having sex, though, and attend a local festival where Daphne is instructed to pick a winner out of three pigs. She asks one of the guys there, what exactly does the winner get? And the guy tells her that the pig gets slaughtered. And that's all she's told. So she doesn't want the innocent pig to get slaughtered. And she tells the crowd that it's a tie. All three pigs win. And people are definitely looking at her pretty cross-eyed as they give her a nice, polite golf clap. Daphne and the Duke, though, then start walking around the crowd where a farmer does approach the Duke about the fact that the rent for farmers has been tripled. It's something that the Duke and, of course, Daphne had no idea about. And they assure him that they will look into it. A little girl then runs up to Daphne crying and Daphne comforts her. And when the little girl's mother shows up to find that the Duchess is comforting her daughter, she's a little embarrassed. But Daphne is extremely kind to this woman. It gives the Duke, though, a glimpse as to what Daphne would have been like as a mother. And as they're walking back to the castle, they have a conversation about it. And the Duke does admit that Daphne is a natural with children. The next day when she wakes up, she heads to the Duke's office, but the Duke is up to his eyeballs in work. He didn't realize just how much of a mess everything truly was. So he's busy for the day, and Daphne has decided to go around town handing out gift baskets. She heads out to the garden with her lady's maid to start picking flowers when Mrs. Coulson catches her and is mortified that the Duchess is picking her own flowers, assuring her that if she just tells her what she needs, she'll get it for her. But Daphne looks at it like it's not that big of a deal. I'm just picking flowers. We don't need to get other people involved. I'm not that much of a diva. And at this point, it's become obvious to even Daphne that Mrs. Coulson doesn't really like her. She then takes those gift baskets, though, and with her lady's maid, she heads to the town, but nobody is accepting her gifts. She can't figure out why because 
because she was told that this was tradition. The little girl from the festival runs up to Daphne once again with her mother in tow. Her mother is very pregnant. And Daphne gives the little girl a hug, but then offers her mother a gift basket. And the woman says that she would accept it, but she doesn't have the arms to take it home with her. So Daphne says, oh, don't worry, we'll walk with you. Daphne then asks the woman, why is it that people are being pretty rude to her? She wants to know if she did something wrong. And the woman lets her know that at the festival, it's tradition for the farmer with the winning pig to get the contract to feed the entire village for the year. When Daphne decided that all three were a tie, nobody was awarded the contract, thus nobody was awarded the money, and it was looked at as a slight. Of course, Daphne had no idea about this, and the woman tells her, well, how could you? Nobody told you. So Daphne is determined to make this right. She also wants to mend the fence with Mrs. Coulson. She feels like they got off to a rocky relationship and with the Duke so preoccupied with his work, when she gets back to the castle, she asks to speak with her. After telling Mrs. Coulson how much she appreciates the help, they get into a conversation about the Duke and his childhood and how the Duke doesn't really seem at ease in Cliveden. And Mrs. Coulson is very aware of this, mentioning how his childhood wasn't the easiest upbringing. And it all had to do with the Duke's father. We know the backstory of that, but Mrs. Coulson mentions how she hated the fact that the Duke's mother was always blamed for this. She tells Daphne that she told the Duchess that a womb cannot quicken without a strong, healthy seed. Unfortunately for Daphne, she doesn't really know what the hell she's talking about. It does, however, give Daphne insight into her husband. Although later that night, when she goes to visit her husband and they have sex, and the Duke pulls out, she starts kind of putting the pieces together. But she confirms this when she heads down and talks to her lady's maid and point-blank asks her, how are babies made? Because she knows nothing. So the woman explains it to her. And that's when Daphne realizes that it's not that the Duke can't have children. He won't have children. And that is why he's pulling out. And this revelation really upsets Daphne. It's just sitting with her. So the next time they have sex, normally the Duke is on top. That position is referred to as missionary. But in a bold move, very early on in the relationship, Daphne spices it up. She flips the Duke over with Daphne now on top, and that position is called Cowgirl. This puts the Duke in a tough spot because now if he wants to pull out, he literally has to chuck his wife off of him. And he doesn't do that. Daphne stands her ground. And for the first time in his life, the Duke does not pull out. I guess the first time that we know of. And Daphne makes it painfully obvious that this was all an orchestrated plan by her by simply getting up and starting to walk out. And the Duke tries to talk to her about what just happened. And that's when she confronts the Duke about the fact that, not that he can't have kids, he's choosing not to. And in Daphne's mind, that is completely different from what she was told. She feels like the Duke lied to her. Can't means you're unable to, won't, well, that's a different story. And she was okay with the fact that the Duke couldn't have her kids, but now knowing that the Duke won't have her kids is very unsettling to her. The Duke, however, feels like he didn't lie to her, telling her that he was prepared to die on a dueling field than take her dream away from her. And it was her who insisted on this marriage. Daphne at one point used the word betrayal. The Duke at one point used the word love. And that sets Daphne off who says, you don't trick the one you love. You don't lie to the one you love. So there's trouble in paradise. In episode seven, it's obvious that the Duke and Daphne have not made up. Their relationship is extremely awkward and contentious. It's gotten to the point where Daphne has actually asked for her items to be removed from the Duke's bedroom, which the Duke is completely against. But their minor squabbling and bickering is interrupted when Daphne gets the latest issue of Whistledown and reads that her brother is entangled in a scandal. So she immediately jumps up and says, I have to head back to my family. And the Duke wants to go with her, but Daphne isn't a fan of that idea. But the Duke says a separate bedroom is one thing, a separate marriage, that cannot be. So the Daphne and Duke head off to the Bridgerton house. And in the latest issue of Whistled Down, she mentions how this scandal doesn't just ruin the Featherington name, it also ruins anyone attached to it, which means it also ruins the Bridgerton reputation. And the best way that Violet can deal with this situation is just to smile and act like nothing's wrong. The problem is no one in town is buying this. They're looking at the Featheringtons a little cross-eyed, and they're also looking at the Bridgertons a little weird because they know that Colin got duped. And while at the Modiste, Eloise suggests that maybe they hold off on putting her into society. One to two years? Because truthfully, she has no interest in ever being put out there in the first place. But Violet really doesn't pay that suggestion any mind. Eloise points out that if you look at the Featherington daughters, they did nothing wrong, yet they're being punished. And all of this is because of the Whistledown pamphlet. The Modiste even chimes in saying that she wouldn't want to cross Whistledown because her word is good as gospel. And that's when Eloise realizes that if 
Whistledown can ruin a reputation, maybe she can also restore one. So Eloise is now hell-bent more than ever on finding out the identity of Lady Whistledown. But the pamphlet really did a number on the Featheringtons, but also Marina more than anybody. So much so that when Portia takes her to a charity where she can have the baby, the charity actually shuns her. Telling Portia that the only way they'll accept her is if Portia makes a sizable donation. So this proves what the Modiste said correct. That night, Daphne and the Duke arrive in town with the Duke dropping Daphne off and the Duke heading to Hastings. And when Daphne walks in, the entire family is surprised to see her, but she tells them that once she read what happened in Whistledown, she came right away. Antony acts like he doesn't need her, but she points out, no, you actually do. The way that Daphne sees it, with her and the Duke arriving back in town, they can go to a party or two, and that's all that everyone will be talking about, including Whistledown. It'll help this scandal involving Colin go by the wayside. But Colin's still pretty upset, and Daphne can tell, and she goes to talk to him, where Colin tells her, you know, I really did want to marry her. But Daphne says, Marina was a stranger to him. Whistledown knew her better than he did. And Colin fires back that Lady Whistledown knows everybody's secrets. And that's when Daphne says, you're lucky to learn her secrets now, rather than after your wedding night. Kind of implying that everything's not great in her marriage. After her meeting with the family, Daphne heads back to Hastings, and she's there by herself, because the Duke spent the night boxing with Will, getting out some of his aggression. He eventually comes home, though, and Daphne is still awake, and she asks him, is this what our marriage is going to be now? You gallivanting the streets doing God knows what as I just sit here waiting for you to come back. And the Duke takes offense to that comment because he's been faithful to her up until this point. But Daphne feels like she's in the right to make that comment because of the Duke's reputation. The two, though, can't keep their hands off of one another. And they end up kissing with the Duke going down on Daphne on the steps. But when Daphne suggests maybe they take this thing into the bedroom, that's when the Duke stops saying, no, we can't do this. We can't ever do this again. So she asks, well, then what is our marriage going to be? And the Duke informs her that if she is to be pregnant, he will take care of the baby. But they are basically married in name only. And this isn't exactly what Daphne signed up for. So she storms off to bed. The next morning, though, she wakes up and she requests the presence of Marina. Because Colin wanted to meet up with Marina, but he was told that wasn't the best idea. Because at this point, the Whistledown pamphlet is painting him as a victim. But the Bridgertons feel like if he goes and visits Marina and he is caught, then people are going to assume that he is the father. But Colin wants answers, so Daphne facilitated this meeting, where at first Colin doesn't believe that this could possibly be true, but Marina says, no, it is. I am with child. And that's when Colin unloads on her. And she doesn't handle it well, but Colin was truly in love with Marina. And he tells her, the worst part about this is if you had just came to me and been honest, I wouldn't even have thought a second about marrying you. But now, with the lying, kick rocks. Marina then heads home crying, and the Bridgertons need to get ready for a picnic going on that is being held by the Queen. And when they show up, it's just as Daphne had predicted. Everybody is looking at the Duke and the Duchess, and everybody is feeling sympathy for the Bridgerton household. Lady Danbury comes up and welcomes them back into town and even invites Daphne to a party at her house the following night with a bunch of other married ladies in high society. Even the Queen has interest in the Bridgertons, although it's Eloise. She wants to get the latest on her theories on who Whistledown is, although Eloise hasn't cracked the case and that kind of annoys the Queen. The Featheringtons do eventually show up and everybody at the party stops what they're doing and stares them down. It's painfully awkward. Eloise actually grabs Penelope to see how she's doing. But all Penelope can think about is Colin. And Eloise tells her Colin's fine. I mean, he's heartbroken and his pride's hurt, but he'll be fine. The men in this always are. But Whistledown has gone way too far with this. She smeared the name of my best friend. So once we find out who she truly is, we'll convince her to restore your name. Write a retraction. But as Eloise is giving Penelope that little pep talk, Portia went up to Violet to try to act like she was also duped and she's also a victim, although Violet just walks off. And one of the aides to the Queen walks up to Portia and tells her that she has to leave. She's no longer welcome. And it's a pretty sad sight. Even Daphne feels pity for the Featheringtons. And when she hears Cressida make a crass comment, she tells her off. She then walks into the garden by herself, but Violet is right on her heels because Violet can tell that something hasn't been right with Daphne since she's arrived home. And she confronts her about it, and Daphne rips into her, saying that Violet did not prepare her for married life. She just used stupid analogies and set up Daphne to go into the real world like a fool. Daphne basically blames Violet for all of her marital problems. Daphne's dressing down only stops when the two are caught by Danbury. 
After the party, though, everybody heads home, including the Featheringtons. They obviously headed home a little bit earlier than everybody else. And Portia lays into Lord Featherington, blaming him for what went down at the party. She then gets word, though, that the Duchess has arrived. And Daphne showed up that day to apologize to Marina. After a little bit of time, she's realized that she has no idea what Marina is going through. And she might have done the same thing if she was in Marina's case. She wants to help her out. Marina lets her know about George and the fact that he's a soldier. And that's when Daphne comes up with the idea of getting in touch with the general. Daphne is under the impression that the general and his wife are still in town. So maybe if she could just talk to the general, she can reunite George and Marina. But Marina says, no, there's no point of that. George has made it painfully clear he doesn't want anything to do with me. He's never written me back. But Daphne doesn't accept that, saying, why should he have control over your life? He should have to answer for what he did. So when Daphne finds out that the general's wife is going to be at that party held by Lady Danbury, she sends her RSVP. And when she shows up, it's nothing like any party she's ever been to. It's a bunch of high society women, but they're letting loose. And Daphne is put at a table with Granville's wife, Cressida's mom, Danbury, and the general's wife. And they're playing a card game, and Daphne is dominating the competition. She's taking all of their money. And throughout the night, she eventually gets to the point where she asks the general's wife if she could possibly find a soldier for her. And the general's wife says, well, you're going to have to ask my husband about that, because it turns out the general isn't in town anymore. He's back on the battlefield. And throughout the conversation that night, Daphne is pretty surprised to hear that a lot of the women aren't real fond of their husbands. They'd actually rather be home alone, able to let loose at parties like this. Most of the women are completely content with being married in name only. And they all think that Daphne's surprised by this because she's in that honeymoon phase, when in reality, Daphne's surprised about this because she realizes now she was a rare one who grew up in a house with true love. Now, on the flip side, the Duke that night went to that men's club where he's approached by Antony because Antony's felt like the Duke has been giving him the cold shoulder ever since the Duke came back into town. And he has. Antony confronts the Duke about what is going on with the Duke and his sister because it's clear that something hasn't gone right, and he figures that it's got to be the Duke's fault. The conversation slowly gets pretty contentious, though, with Antony telling the Duke that his father never prepared him to lead a household, and the Duke telling Antony that his father would be ashamed right now because Antony hasn't married, kept on the family name. It eventually comes to blows. So when Daphne arrives home from her party that night, she finds the Duke all banged up and she starts tending to his wounds. But shortly that leads to kissing, and she once again wants to take things further, but the Duke doesn't. And when she brings up how happy they would be with a child, the Duke flat out pulls away. So she asks him, why won't you have kids? And that's when the Duke tells her that it all has to do with the vow he made to his father on his deathbed not to keep the family name together. And Daphne cannot believe that all of this is over a promise made to a guy who's no longer alive. She tells the Duke, you know, you made a promise to me too. You made wedding vows. So you'd rather break the promise to me than break the promise to the guy that's no longer on this planet. And the Duke doesn't really dispel that theory. So she alerts him that she's due to have her period in a couple days. So they'll know pretty shortly what promise he's going to break. The next day, a new pamphlet from Whistledown comes out, and it's all about how the Duchess and the Duke haven't really had company since they've been back in town. But Lady Whistledown theorizes that it's because they're still in that honeymoon phase. She doesn't know yet that it's really because they kind of can't stand each other. But Whistledown omitted the party that the Queen held. So when the Queen reads Whistledown's latest pamphlet, and not a mention of her party is in there, she gets really offended, and now Whistledown is in her crosshairs. Daphne, however, really couldn't care less. She started her day writing a letter to the general, and then she headed over to the Featherington's household to let Marina know what she did. But when Marina finds out that the Duke didn't sign off on it, all of the hope she had is gone by the wayside. Because she feels like there's no way the general is just going to respond to a duchess without the Duke's consent. She appreciates what Daphne did, but she has no hope. In the other room down the hall, though, Eloise is there talking to Penelope about who Whistledown could be. And the latest theory is she must be a tradesperson. And she's so excited about her new theory and can't wait to tell the queen that night. But in order to do that, she's going to have to attend a concert, which means she's going to have to be put out in public. And even though she doesn't want to be introduced in society, she cares more about letting the queen know who Whistledown could be. So that night, Eloise gets all dolled up, and Violet is thrilled not realizing the true intentions behind this. And all of the Bridgertons head to the concert. Even Colin shows up. He does have an awkward conversation with Granville about what exactly is up with Granville's marriage, and Granville tells him that he's in love with the guy who Colin caught him with, and this allows his wife to really do whatever the hell she wants. 
Colin, though, can't wrap his head around this, and Granville kind of calls him a hypocrite, saying, you want to be different. You kind of want this free lifestyle, yet maybe that's all it is from you, is talk. And while Colin was getting an earful from Granville, Eloise tried to go up to the Queen to give her her theory, but the Queen fires her, saying that she's hired private investigators to find out the true identity of Whistledown. She no longer needs Eloise's services. So at this point, Eloise doesn't want to be there, and Colin really doesn't want to be there either. So they head home in a carriage. But on the way home, Colin says that he's picking up a friend. And that's when they stop at the Modistes. And this is a big surprise to Eloise. She had no idea that Colin and the Modistes were a thing. Eventually, though, the awkward carriage ride is broken up when the Modistes asks Eloise how her night's going. And Eloise tells her that out of all of the people at that party, and there were so many, she didn't have a meaningful conversation with anybody. And the Modistes interjects and says, well, everybody but the Featheringtons. And that's when the light bulb goes off for Eloise and she realizes that the Modiste is Lady Whistledown. She does, however, keep this theory to herself. Back at the concert, though, Antony is in one balcony, but he can't keep his eyes off of the crowd because he sees Sienna, although she's there with another guy. And then over with Daphne, unfortunately, she rushes to the bathroom where her Aunt Flo came to town, and she breaks down crying because she truly believed that she was pregnant. But the Modiste was correct. The only people not in attendance were the Featheringtons. And Penelope goes to check on Marina that night, but Marina had put a bunch of herbs in some tea and drank it in an attempt to kill her baby. And when Penelope opens the door, she finds Marina unconscious. She calls for Portia's help, but there's not a lot that Portia can do. And Lord Featherington wasn't there because he has a scheme to get back in the black. He sees a poster for Will's next fight and approaches him about throwing it. At first, Will says, my honor isn't for sale. But the more that Featherington pushes, the more that Will truly realizes that he could set his family up for life by taking the sure thing and throwing the fight instead of actually fighting this guy and trying to win. And this definitely has Will thinking. And in the season finale, great news, Marina didn't die. Although she's pretty convinced her baby did. She's on the men and Penelope's looking after her a little bit. And Marina apologizes for everything that went down, saying that, Penelope was right. Colin's a good guy. He didn't deserve that. They then hear a horse outside and figure that it might be a suitor. But when they go to the window and Marina looks out of it, she looks like she's seen a ghost. And no, it's not George, but it's George's brother. In order, though, to have a proper one-on-one, they have to wait for Portia, who is out running some errands. Now, over with the Duke and the Duchess, now that Daphne and the Duke know that they're not going to be having a child, they've decided to split up. But they're holding off on the announcement until after the season, which is only in a few days. So in the meantime, they have to get the 1800th century of a portrait mode done, an actual portrait, which is being done by Granville, who's having a tough time because it seems like they can't stand each other as they're standing there. And he expresses this so they look longingly into each other's eyes, and you can tell that there's still an attraction there, and even Granville can see it. And while the Duke and Daphne are getting their portrait painted, the rest of the Bridgerton household is kind of just sitting around, hanging out, with Eloise grilling Benedict on how he knows the modiste, what she's into, where she hangs out. He thinks it's all because she's a tradesperson, when in reality it's just because Eloise thinks that she's whistled down. Violet does walk in the room because she's gotten word that their cousin is showing up later that day, which excites pretty much everybody. Before the cousin shows up, though, Violet goes and meets with Daphne as they walk the market, and that's when Daphne tells Violet that her and the Duke are going their separate ways. Violet thinks it's a huge mistake, saying it can't be that bad. You can probably work this out, but Daphne tells her as soon as he decided he'd rather betray me than the grudge that he made to his dead father, then that was pretty much it. They then get interrupted, though, by Portia, who walks up and starts saying how unfortunate it is because they don't have an invite to the ball that night, and the ball is being held by the Duke and the Duchess. And Violet does not want to help her out at all, but Daphne says, don't worry about it, your daughters will be extended an invitation. Portia's lady maid then walks up to her and tells her that a carriage has arrived at the house with a Mr. Crane in it, and that piques the interest of Daphne, thinking that it's George. So everybody heads to the Featherington household, but they find out that it's not actually George, it's his brother. And he tells the group that there's a reason Marina hasn't heard from George in a while. It's because, unfortunately, George passed away on the battlefield. Marina walks out of the room, and Daphne goes chasing after her, where Marina tells Daphne that George is in the process of actually writing her back. George's brother, Philip, found the letter in his belongings where he was promising Marina that they two could run away together. He was in love with her. And she's very appreciative of Daphne because if it wasn't for Daphne, Philip never would have known that Marina was there. And she never would have known how George truly felt about her. 
Marina then walks off to be with herself, and Daphne heads back to Hastings, where she runs into the Duke, and the Duke is heading off to Will's boxing match that day, a boxing match he has decided to throw for a fat payday. And the Duke asks Daphne if she's coming with, but she says no because she has to prepare for the ball that night. Right before he walks out, though, Daphne says, what did your father do to make you take that vow? But Simon just isn't ready to have that conversation with her, saying it's best if she just doesn't know. Simon then heads off to the boxing match where Will is acting pretty weird. When his wife brings up that they could take this boxing thing around the country, he says, no, we have to prepare for our future. I can't do this forever. He's also got Lord Featherington walking around the ring staring him down. Lord Featherington walks up to these two guys that are in a gang to place a sizable wager on the guy that Will is fighting. And they know that something's up because the only reason a lord would ever bet with them is if his word just isn't good anywhere else. But Featherington, to make sure that they take the bet, offers up the deed to his house. Now it's on Will to come through. The fight starts going on and... Anthony is in attendance, but he's not focused on the fight because also in attendance is Sienna and her new man. Although, they're making eyes at each other and they both kind of go to the bathroom, a.k.a. bang one out under the bleachers. So, there's still fireworks there. Back in the ring, however, Will is putting on a clinic with this guy. He's beating the crap out of him. It's putting a fear of God into Featherington, but he does end up doing his job, taking a fall, and it's something that even the Duke notices isn't kosher. Featherington doesn't care. He's just elated that he won his bet, although the guys he made the bet with definitely think that something fishy went down. After the fight, the Duke goes into the locker room where Will is and starts to dress him down about taking a dive, mentioning honor and all of that, but Will says, hold on, what's more honorable than taking care of one's family? He figures that all of this coming from the Duke has nothing really to do with the fight. It has more to do with what the Duke is dealing with in his own marriage. So he tells him, look, man, you're not mad at me. Take that someplace else and kicks the Duke out. But while the Duke was at the fight, Daphne was hell bent on finding out exactly what happened between the Duke and his father. And after snooping around a couple of drawers, she finds the letter that the Duke wrote to his dad when he was a little kid. The same letters that his dad never opened, never read. And as she's reading them, Lady Danbury comes in the room and they start having a conversation about the relationship between the Duke and his dad and how awful it was. The stuttering problem, the perfectionist that his dad wanted him to be, how Lady Danbury really helped him out in all ways. It's really eye-opening to Daphne who says that Simon can't be more different than that. This conversation with Danbury really changes Daphne's mood around the Duke. The next morning, the two have breakfast together, which hasn't been a real trend, and she tells the Duke that she's going back to her family home because her cousin's showing up, and she does want him to come with because it might be weird if he doesn't. So after breakfast, they head over and they start conversing with the Bridgerton family. Over in the corner, though, Benedict is yelling at Eloise because Eloise went to go pay the modiste a visit where she didn't come right out and say, your Lady Whistledown. She she just hinted around it, saying things like, well, I really hope Lady Whistledown makes retractions. It would be a shame if Lady Whistledown ruined the name of my friend. But as Benedict is having this conversation with Eloise, Anthony comes over and says, what are you guys talking about? And Benedict comes out and says, I'm having a relationship with the modiste. And he expects Anthony to be completely against it, but Anthony, who has his own thing going on with Sienna, says, no, I'm happy for you. Penelope even shows up for this party, although when she walks in, Colin's singing and, man, she's swooning. But Eloise pulls her aside and tells her that she's figured out who Whistledown is. It's Madame Delacroix, the modiste. But at this little party, the Duke absolutely shines with the little kids. I mean, he's a natural. After the party, Penelope heads back to the Featherington household where they've had quite a day because Philip came back and actually proposed to Marina saying that that's what George would have wanted, him to take care of Marina and her child. But Marina said no. She didn't know Philip. She wasn't in love with Philip. She had no interest in marrying Philip. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that she was convinced that she had terminated the child. So she just headed up to her room. Portia Featherington let Marina be, and she took some of the winnings from Lord Featherington and paid off the debt at the Modiste. This allowed the Featherington girls to get brand new dresses, unfortunately, for Penelope. She's still stuck in hideous yellow. As the girls are trying on dresses, they hear a plate outside crash, and that's because... Marina was getting some food and she felt something in her stomach and she immediately knows that she needs to talk to a doctor. They call a doctor in and the doctor lets her know, yeah, that whole herbal tea trying to terminate a baby thing, shockingly, that didn't work. You're still pregnant. So Marina's going to have to call up Philip again and see if he wants to get married because she needs some reassurances. 
Now, most of the town that night is getting ready for the final ball of the season, which is being held by the Duke and the Duchess. And right before the ball, they're admiring their painting, and they start discussing how they want to play this whole thing, how many dances they want to do together. They don't want to make it too obvious that they're splitting up after this. Even through the conversation, though, you can tell that they still have feelings for each other, and Daphne tells the Duke that he was wonderful with the children. He tells her that children always have adored him, but that doesn't mean he wants any of his own. So the two prepare for one last dance. The ball kicks off and Antony headed to pick up his date for the night, Sienna. They were hanging out earlier and they talked about making the relationship public. He was to pick her up that night and take her to the ball as his date. But when he went to pick her up, she was still with that other guy. He's dressed like Tom Cruise in Risky Business. Porky Pig in it. All shirt, no pants. It was awkward. And Sienna tells Antony that all that talk that they had was great, but in reality, she wants to be with somebody who's not going to make her change. And that's this rando with the mustache and great hair. So she breaks things off with Antony. Eloise shows up with Violet all dolled up, but she's extremely uncomfortable. She's still on the hunt, though, for Whistledown. The Featheringtons show up, Benedict and Colin show up, and when Colin sees Penelope, he goes over to talk to her and apologizes to her for everything that happened with Marina, saying that Penelope was right. Penelope, though, can't keep her feelings to herself anymore. She knows she needs to tell Colin how she feels. But right before she does, he says, well, I have something to tell you, too. I'm leaving first thing tomorrow morning. I'm going to start my tour in the Mediterranean, and you actually helped me remember how much I wanted to travel. This puts a kibosh on Penelope telling Colin how she feels. And she starts to rush out of the ball, but Eloise stops her and tells her, look, the queen's here. I'm going to tell her about Whistledown. But at that point, Penelope doesn't care. She just wants to go home. The poor girl is in a hideous yellow dress, and she's heartbroken. So Eloise walks up to tell the queen her latest theory, but the queen's minion stops her, saying nobody just walks up to the queen. So Eloise starts to smooth talk him a little bit, complimenting him, telling him that it was probably his idea to try to track down Whistledown, which he admits, yeah, it was. And through this conversation, he says that they figured out a printing press that Whistledown gets her pamphlets printed at. And they also know that she drops it off on nights like this, where the entire town is at a ball. So they're actually waiting her out as we speak. And that puts the fear of God into Eloise because she wants to get to whistle down before the queen does. And she knows at this point she's on borrowed time. So she pays a carriage driver to ride off to the printing press and try to intercept whistle down. And she does that. Whistle down's carriage shows up, but so do the queen's men. And she yells to whistle down's carriage that it's a trap. Whistle down is able to get away and her identity is still a secret. It's all because of Eloise. Back at the ball, however, Danbury walks up to the Duke and says, I'm assuming that your plans to separate from Daphne haven't changed. And he says, no, they haven't. She tells him that pride is going to cost him everything and leave him with nothing. He shouldn't allow it to happen to him like it did to his father. Violet is also trying to do her best to keep the Duke and Duchess together by having a conversation with Daphne about love and about how the relationship between Violet and her husband wasn't always easy, but they chose to love one another. They didn't just give up. They then have the moment of their last dance, and as they're waltzing around the dance floor, it starts to rain. And everybody gets off except the Duke and the Duchess. At one point, Philippa and her guy try to go back on, but Danbury, being that bad bitch, stops them. Because the Featheringtons aren't going to ruin this moment. Danbury announces to everybody that this party is over. And in the rain, Daphne tells the Duke that she's aware of why the Duke made that vow to his father. And just because somebody isn't perfect doesn't make them any less worthy of love. She tells him, I'm tired of pretending and acting like I don't love you. I love you. I love all of you. Even the parts that you believe are too dark and shameful, I love. You might believe that you're too damaged to ever be happy, but you can choose differently. And then she leaves. They meet back up at Hastings and he tells her, I don't want to be alone and I know that now. And they agree to stay together. They then have sex where the Duke does not pull out. So that's one happy ending to the night. Unfortunately, over in the Featheringtons, when they get home from the ball, they have terrible news as Lord Featherington has been killed. He went to a brothel that night to celebrate his winnings, but the guys that he screwed over were waiting for him, and they killed him, and they took his money. It's left Portia Featherington not knowing what she's going to do. When Eloise finds out, she heads over to comfort Penelope. They then get into a conversation about what happened between Eloise and Whistledown, and Eloise lets her know that she was able to save Whistledown, and she's pretty positive that next season, Whistledown will write what she did wrong with the Featheringtons. 
Colin is not the only one that's leaving, though. Marina is also leaving. She was able to get in touch with Philip, and Philip agreed to marry her. She has a conversation with Portia about how she did it, how she was in a relationship so long with someone that she didn't love. And Portia lets her know that it isn't easy, but you learn to love things. You learn to love your children, the house. And she knows that Marina will be good with it because Marina is strong. So Marina gets in a carriage with a guy she barely knows and heads off. And as the Featherington girls are watching the carriage go by, the lady's maid runs up to Portia because they've located the guy that's going to inherit the Featherington estate. And by the looks of it, Portia doesn't seem thrilled. Over at the Bridgertons, they say goodbye to Colin, and the Duke, Duchess, and Antony are having a conversation where the Duke tells Antony that they've decided to stay in London for a little bit. Antony has also made a pretty big decision in his life to find a Viscountess. Antony is on the market. He's looking for a wife. He doesn't even care about love at this point. He's given up on that. And at this point, Eloise has made it back to the Bridgerton household because it's right across the street. And she's talking to Benedict about the Modiste. And it turns out the Modiste is heading back to France. And Eloise says, are you going to say goodbye to her? And Benedict says, well, I did last night. I was with her. And that means the Modiste is not Lady Whistledown. Now, fast forward a couple months later. Surprise! It's a boy! Daphne and the Duke welcome their first child into the world together. They don't have names picked out, but they know that it will be an A because that is the Bridgerton tradition. Oh, and then finally, we do find out who Whistledown is. It was Penelope the whole time. In season two, we have a new season, and two of the Bridgerton kids are looking for a match, although neither one is really all that interested. You've got Antony, who at this point is just settling down to shut his mother up, and you've got Eloise, who... She's just of age, although she's dreading it too. Daphne has actually come back, leaving the Duke and her child back at home so she could help out her sister with the whole season. The Featherington girls are also looking for a match after striking out last year. The only one who found a match was Philippa, and she's waiting to marry Mr. Finch, but they still have to pay the dowry, which they don't have. They're waiting for the new Lord Featherington to come over, and they're kind of dreading it. The stories about this guy don't paint a pretty picture. Mrs. Featherington is actually convinced that because of the fact he hasn't shown up yet is an indication that he's punishing them. In order to make ends meet, they might have to start selling off some goods. Now, because they were presented to the Queen last year, they don't have to go through the whole ceremony that Daphne went through and they went through where you have to go to the Queen and bow and do all that crap. Eloise, however, does. And she is dreading it. She's nervous. She's kind of hyperventilating. And even though Daphne is giving her tips... She just doesn't look as composed as her sister did a year ago. She also has the pressure of what her sister did a year ago weighing on her shoulders. That doesn't help either. But when it comes time for her to make her introduction to the queen, and by the way, it's not like the queen doesn't know who she is. It's still a formality. Her introduction gets interrupted because Lady Whistledown is back. And as soon as the new pamphlet comes out, the queen immediately gets distracted and calls it for a day. The city scoops up the newest edition of Whistledown, reading her every word, finding out where she's been, and getting the latest gossip before the season really kicks off. This means a lot of money for Penn. While most of the city is reading Whistledown, the Bridgertons head back to their place, and Eloise continues to learn how to properly dance. Antony is also preparing, but he's looking at this strictly as a business transaction. He goes through an interview process, just like you would to interview for a job. Although none of the women even come remotely close for his ridiculously high standards. It's not like he's due to take just anybody. He truly is looking for that special somebody. The problem is it's hard to have chemistry with a guy when he's interviewing you. A couple of days after finding absolutely no wife, early in the morning he's on horseback. He's kind of just sitting there with his thoughts. And then all of a sudden somebody whizzes by him on a horse. He thinks the person's in trouble and he goes chasing after them until he reaches a roadblock, which they jumped over and he's unwilling to do. And that's when he sees that this person on a horseback is actually a female. She kind of gives him a nod like, I just bested you, but he's not deterred at all. He finds a shortcut and catches up to the woman. She doesn't introduce herself, but her name is Kate Sharma. And while she's there for the season, in the moment, she's having just a nice conversation with Anthony Bridgerton. They both have no idea who they are. But right off the bat, Anthony is smitten pretty hard. He tries to escort her back to where she's going, but she has no interest in that whatsoever. When she takes off, he's more intrigued by her than ever. But she's actually staying at Lady Danbury's house. Her mother's an old friend of Danbury. And Kate, along with her younger sister, Edwina, have arrived for the season. Although not so much for Kate, strictly for Edwina. Even though Kate is 26, she's really being an advisor to her younger sister. And by advisor, I mean she's being a total bitch. And I mean that as respectfully as possible. 
But there's a lot of pressure on Edwina to be the diamond of the season. Dan Barry knows she can help, while Kate thinks she's got it all figured out. While they might differ in opinion, Edwina has two really intelligent women in her corner. Edwina wasn't able to make the initial introductions to the Queen. This was by design by Lady Danbury. She wants to oversee the first introductions between Edwina and the Queen. And that makes Miss Lady Sharma very uncomfortable. That's because Lady Mary was the diamond of her season. That is, until she had the audacity to fall in love with just a common man. She eloped with him to India, and her parents never lived down the shame. Her returning is a pretty big deal. It's quite scandalous. A lot of women never thought that she would show her face there again, but she's back with her two daughters. Doesn't mean she's not nervous, though. But she has to get Edwina ready for that night's ball, hosted by Lady Danbury. Everybody's going to be in attendance. But Edwina is quite nervous before she makes her first big appearance. She sits down with Kate and has a conversation because she can tell that really her mom is nervous, which is making her nervous. She's also very concerned with her relationship with Kate. They're not biological sisters. They're half-sisters. Gossip like this could ruin her. Kate, however, promises that Lady Danbury will smooth everything over and Edwina has nothing to worry about. I mean, after all, Kate has been training Edwina for this moment basically her entire life. She's ready. She tells her, this is the first chapter of a happy story. Don't forget, it's not an appearance or a title that will woo you. It's his mind. That'll catch your eye. They then get dressed and head into the ball. Right away, Lady Danbury starts pointing out potential suitors, but not for Edwina. She's pointing them out for Kate. But Kate tells Danbury that she has no interest in finding a match for herself. She's strictly there to help her sister. She then starts quizzing Danbury on what she's heard about certain dukes and lords. Because Kate has done her research on potential matches for Edwina. The queen then walks in and catches Danbury's eye, and she decides to have the introductions with the Sharmas sooner rather than later. Rip the Band-Aid off, which Lady Mary isn't a huge fan of, but once again, you gotta rip the Band-Aid off. And it goes horribly. Lady Danbury makes the introduction, but the queen knows exactly who Lady Mary is. She gives her a snide comment and walks off. While the Sharmas are a little down, Lady Danbury loves a good challenge. As Danbury was having the introductions with the queen, the Bridgertons were showing up. It's the last place that Eloise wants to be, and it's not like Antony's all that interested in being there either, but it's a formality he has to. He does, however, get really mad at his mother when she proclaims to the entire room that the Viscount is looking for a wife this season. All of a sudden, he is inundated with women looking to add his name to their dance card. The Featheringtons have also arrived. Philippa goes and finds Mr. Finch, but Mr. Finch's parents are also there, and they're wondering where exactly the dowry is, so that they can wed their son to Philippa. Mrs. Featherington, not having the dowry at the moment, puts on the waterworks, making up a lie that she just is still dealing with the loss of her husband, hoping that that's going to buy her some time, which it looks like it's going to. As the party's going on, somebody catches Kate's eye, and it's Antony. She recognizes him after all she did have a conversation with him a couple hours ago. She asks Lady Danbury, who is that? And Danbury says, oh, that's the Viscount. I don't think I've made an introduction between you two. You have quite the eye, though. He's wealthy, he's well-connected, and he comes from one of the most illustrious families in town. He may be our most eligible bachelor this season. Kate finds him attractive, and so does Edwina. A man then comes up named Lord Corning and asks for Edwina's hand to go take her out to dance, and Kate has to approve of it. Edwina trusts Kate no matter what, and she looks to her for all signs on what to do. It shows how powerful Kate really is in this situation. Danbury has to tell her that that's not the way you do things. You don't turn down dances if you have an open space on your card. Frankly, it pisses her off. And speaking of dance cards, Eloise's dance card is full. Although, it's full of fake names. She has absolutely zero interest in dancing with anybody. She'd much rather hang out with Penn. Although, Penn is more interested in collecting information for her next edition of Whistledown. But even though Eloise has no interest in dancing with anybody, doesn't mean that Lady Bridgerton is going to allow her to just sit back and be a wallflower for the entire party. She pulls her away from Penn and starts introducing her to people. As the party goes on, Kate cannot take her eyes off the other Bridgerton, Antony. And when he steps outside to get some air, she kind of follows him. Antony, though, sees a bunch of guys that he knows, so he goes over and starts conversing with them. And Kate ends up eavesdropping on the conversation. She doesn't like what she hears. The way that Antony talks about the season and about finding a wife, it leaves a lot to be desired. He doesn't really care about a love match, or at least it's what he tells the guys. 
He basically talks about finding a wife like you would finding a horse. It completely turns Kate off. She tries to get out of there, but she knocks into a flower pot. It alerts Anthony that there's someone around the corner, and it leads to a very awkward conversation between the two. He starts off very friendly, but she starts off very hostile. She admits to eavesdropping on his conversation, although she claims that it was loud enough for anybody to hear, but she makes it very, very clear that what she heard, she didn't like, and she takes off. Kate walks up to Lady Danbury, who's in mid-conversation with Lady Bridgerton, and she tells her, we're leaving now. We were unprepared to handle this lion's den, and we're leaving. It catches Lady Danbury completely off guard. She was actually having a conversation with Lady Bridgerton about the fact that they have common interests, i.e. Edwina, or Kate for that matter, and Antony. So this conversation is a pretty big turnoff, but Kate's not asking permission. She's more of giving a directive. She's not the only one that wants to take off, though. Penelope wants to take off because she has to get her next edition of Whistle Down to the printer. Although right before she leaves, Eloise stops her and latches onto her. It's not like Penn can tell her that she has to go. So she's going to have to wait until she gets home that night to head to the printer to get the next edition out. The next day, the next edition of Whistle Down does come out and a lot of it has to do with Antony and if he's really ready to settle down. But the big crux of the issue has to do with the fact that the queen has yet to name a diamond. Whistledown states that if the Queen doesn't do it, maybe she's going to have to do it for her, which pisses off the Queen, because she is hell-bent on finding out who Whistledown is this season. The entire town is reading Whistledown. They're also getting ready for the next party. The Bridgertons call the Modiste to help with Eloise's dress, and as the Modiste is leaving, she runs into Benedict. Benedict is thrilled to see the Modiste. The Modiste, however, is kind of weird with him. Very short. When Benedict asks if he will see her later that night, she says she's busy with work. Oh, God, I've heard that before. It's always an excuse. They're never busy with work. They're busy with another guy. Anyway, I'll move on. The awkward conversation is seen by Antony. So when Benedict sits down, he asks, what was all that about? Benedict, however, switches the topic of conversation immediately, asking if Antony's entire game plan is just to insult every girl that's available until there's none left. That way, he doesn't have to marry. Anthony doesn't want to have this conversation, so he tries to leave, but his mother is right behind him and grabs him. She starts trying to find out if maybe her son is interested in any of the women that he was talking to. She starts mentioning, well, this girl was nice and that girl was nice, but the fact is, Anthony isn't interested in any of them, especially the women that his mother is mentioning. He tells his mother in not so many words that he doesn't appreciate the women that were pushed in front of him. What he's looking for is perfection, and he simply hasn't found it. And the fact that his mother is pushing women on him that he doesn't consider perfect is making him question his mother's taste and her decision making for that matter. I mean, after all, this is going to be the future woman of the household. His mother, however, is concerned that at the end of the day, he's going to end up alone. Now, down the street at the Featherington household, Penn is extremely stressed out. The stress of getting caught as Lady Whistledown is starting to get to her. When Prudence comes in and notices that she's been writing, Penn gets super nervous that she's going to be found out. Prudence just says that she's been writing to Colin Bridgerton. And her mom has to come in and explain that Colin Bridgerton is not her friend. While Colin Bridgerton actually is her friend, what her mother's really trying to say is Penelope is wasting her time on this dream that she's going to end up with Colin. I mean, after all, Colin is gallivanting through the world. It's quite frustrating for Penn. She's not the only woman in town that's frustrated. Lady Danbury is also frustrated with the person that's living in her house, Kate. She knows that Kate has been going on morning rides, even though Kate has been trying to hide it from everybody. Kate has done a pretty good job, but Lady Danbury tells her, I know everything that goes on here. She then pulls out correspondence to Kate's grandparents, but Kate lets her know, those aren't my grandparents. I have no relation to them whatsoever. But even though they're not Kate's grandparents, they are Edwina's grandparents. Lady Danbury tells her that the real reason of the conversation is to figure out why Kate didn't tell her the real reason why she showed up with her sister. She wants the truth. After all, she's been extremely kind to an old friend, and now she's got a woman living in her house that's lying to her. There's something fishy with this story. Kate eventually comes clean. She tells them that the grandparents never recovered from the embarrassment of their mother moving to India and marrying a common man. After her father died, her, along with Lady Mary, did the best they could to raise Edwina so she wouldn't know about the struggles they were actually dealing with. But because of it, they went broke. They actually used the last of their money to get into town to get to Lady Danbury's house. The grandparents, who are the Sheffields, have agreed to put a sizable dowry to Edwina 
and have agreed to also look after Lady Mary if they find Edwina a suitable husband. And by suitable, it means somebody with rank and title. That is why Kate is so hyper-focused on who is talking to her sister. While she tells her sister it's about love, in her mind, that's just a bonus. This is about her mother surviving. Lady Danbury tells her, your sister does have a right to know. It is her future. But Kate says, no, that's why I shield her from this. If she knew about this, she would marry the first guy she met very quickly just to please us. Edwina deserves a chance to find love, although she better find love with somebody with a nice title. Lady Danbury realizes they really do have their work cut out this season. The next night, they have the next party. Lady Danbury escorts Lady Mary, Kate, and Edwina back up to the Queen, saying hello to her. The Queen is as rude as she was the previous night. But all the Sharma women keep their head held high. Lady Danbury tells them, go have some refreshments. And then she has a private conversation with the Queen, and she spends it selling the Queen on making Edwina the diamond of the season. Edwina, though, has some competition. Despite her best efforts, Eloise has her introduction with the Queen. The Queen does apologize for having skipped over the introduction a couple days ago, which, by the way, it was fine with Eloise. But when she tells her that she has some big shoes to fill because of last season with Daphne, Eloise makes a comment that she's not into diamonds anyway, she's into emeralds. Kind of takes everybody off guard, but the Queen loved it because the Queen loves emeralds. It makes Eloise think that she really does have a chance of being named the diamond of the season. She runs off and starts panicking to Penn about the whole situation. She can't believe the Queen likes her. She confides in Penn that the stress of living up to Daphne from last season is getting to her. She knows that every time she walks into a room, they're comparing her to Daphne. It sucks that she just can't be herself. But as those two are having that conversation outside, inside, the Queen is announcing her diamond. And it's not Eloise. To everybody's shock, it is Edwina. Because Edwina was named the diamond, it catches Antony's eye. And he runs up to get the first dance with her. Because he's a Vi account, he's able to. As Antony is getting acquainted with Edwina, he starts conversing with her and she is just what he was looking for. She's well-spoken. She is interesting. She is perfect. While those two are dancing, Kate is thanking Lady Danbury, but Lady Danbury tells her, I hate to break it to you, now the real work begins. They might not have to work too hard, though. Antony and Edwina are smitten. But when Kate sees Edwina dancing with Antony, she's completely against it. She rips Edwina away from the conversation and tells her sister, you are not to go near that man again. Everybody then goes home, and when the Featheringtons get home, there's a bunch of suitcases in their foray. That's because the new Lord Featherington has arrived, and he was not as advertised. Lady Featherington had made him out to be this old, decrepit, angry guy, and in fact, he's a lot younger. That's because the guy that she was describing, he didn't show up, his son did. And he couldn't be more unlike what she described. He's already paid the dowry, so Philippa can get married, and it seems like he really is going to provide for them. In episode two, now that the queen has announced the diamond, Kate has made a list of her top choices for Edwina to marry. And Anthony Bridgerton is not on that list. News of how difficult Kate is being through the process has made it to Whistledown, and she writes about it in her latest pamphlet. The fact that she left off Antony does not go unnoticed by Lady Danbury or Lady Mary, for that matter. They think it's an oversight, but Kate makes it known. It's no oversight. But just because Antony is not on the list now doesn't mean he's willing to give up. He does think Edwina would be perfect. Later that day, since she has been named the Diamond, she has pretty much every guy lined up outside of her door to get a word with her. One of those guys is Antony Bridgerton, although he doesn't really wait in the line. He wants to skip it because, after all, he is a Viscount. When he shows up, Kate tells him, you're way too late. you got to go to the back of the line. He's not interested, though, in speaking to her right then and there. He wants to escort her to the horse races later in the day, but Kate tells him she's already got an escort. He starts asking about the next day and the day after that, and every time he asks about a different day, Kate shoots him down. Kate actually finds it hilarious that Antony has decided to show up after what she heard the other night and what she's read about him, but he's simply not willing to give up. As Antony was trying to find his future wife, his sister, Eloise, has her nose buried in a pamphlet, a Whistledown pamphlet. For a little bit there, she was anti-Whistledown, but after Whistledown's previous pamphlet kind of stated that the whole situation was ridiculous and how women are judged on things that aren't their minds, Eloise is back on board, which is music to Penn's ears. She starts talking to Penn about how she knows that she can convince Whistledown to write something meaningful, but her mother just wants her to find a husband. Penelope starts backing up Lady Bridgerton on the matter, and then all of a sudden, to her shock, Colin Bridgerton walks to the door. 
He's not the only one who returns, though. Right behind him is Anthony. And he's excited to see his brother, but more so because of the fact that they can head to the races as a united front, the Bridgerton family. And no, it's not because Anthony wants to spend time with his family. He has a plan. Penelope decides to head home. And when she does, there's a new artwork display on the wall, right as you enter the house. It's guns and antlers. Very American. Lady Featherington ain't feeling it. As Penelope, Mrs. Varley, and Lady Featherington are looking at this monstrosity, the new Lord Featherington, or Cousin Jack as he's going by, comes down and tells the women, get dressed, we're going to the races. Most of the town is there, and that includes Kate, Lady Danbury, and Edwina. Edwina's companion that day is a guy named Lord Lumley, who's all about poetry. But as they're walking along, a guy named Thomas Dawsett comes up, and he wants to be introduced to Miss Sharma, but not Edwina, he wants to be introduced to Kate. Kate is definitely flattered. The two start walking together, and he starts asking her questions about her life. But she does get distracted when she notices Anthony Bridgerton lurking. The Bridgerton boys, however, get called away by Will Mondrich. He's done fighting, and he's decided to open up his own business. It's a gentleman's club. And no, I'm not talking about like a strip club. I'm talking about a place where guys can go and hang out. He invites the Bridgerton boys to stop on by, although they're already a part of a gentleman's club called the Whites. Benedict is all for going. Antony, though, has his eyes set on Edwina. And as Edwina and Kate are sitting with their escorts, Antony makes his move. As soon as he walks up, both Lord Lumley and Dawsett stand up and pay him respects. The fact is, a Viscount's approval means a lot. All of them are happy to see him, except Kate. Dawsett introduces himself to Antony for the first time, and Antony is nice enough to him, but he turns to Edwina and lets her know that he was unable to greet her this morning because he was spending time with his family for breakfast. It's something that they love doing, which is a complete lie. When Kate kind of puts down the Bridgertons, Lord Lumley actually sticks up for him, saying that there's no greater family in the area. And in fact, him and his mother have wanted to come by the Bridgerton household and enjoy tea there for quite some time, which Antony says, we'll make that happen. He then is able to convince Lord Lumley to go get lemonade for Edwina. It frees up a spot for Antony to sit right next to her and start whispering sweet nothings in her ear. Because of the fact that she doesn't like Antony, Kate gets extremely impatient, and when Lumley takes a little too long for her liking to bring back refreshments, she makes mention of the fact that maybe Antony should go and look for him. Antony, though, says, no, I'm not doing that, not with the race about to start. Edwina asks Antony his opinion on who will win the race, and when he gives it, Kate scoffs at it. And to be fair, Kate's opinion isn't just a guess, it's well-researched. As those two kind of argue about who will win the race, a couple rows back, Lady Bridgerton and Lady Danbury are talking about the fact that Antony has squirmed his way next to Edwina. Although Lady Danbury does mention, there is a roadblock, and her name is Kate. There's also another roadblock. Edwina wants a love match, and everyone knows that's something that the Viscount doesn't really care for. It's going to be up to Lady Bridgerton to maybe change the Viscount's mind. A little while later, Lumley comes back with the refreshments, but Antony doesn't leave. They just make room for Lumley to sit down. Lumley knows exactly what Antony did, although he can't really say anything. He just has to sit there and now share his date with him. They sit down, the race begins, and when the horse reaches the finish line, it is the horse that Kate said would win that ends up taking first place. Kate doesn't let Antony live it down. She starts gloating about it. It's a little awkward, so Edwina tells Kate, does that horse not remind you about the one that I used to love when I was a little girl? Kate remembers the one, and Antony says, oh, well, take my arm. We'll go down to see him. The three of Antony, Edwina, and Lumley go ahead. And Dawson asks Kate, why do you feel the need to jab at Bridgerton? She tells him that it's her duty as an older sister to make it difficult for the Viscount. And Dawson says, well, he doesn't like to lose, not even back at Oxford. And right then and there, Dawson realizes he screwed up. Earlier in the day, he acted like he was meeting Bridgerton for the first time. But now he's admitting that he went to Oxford with him. Kate is now convinced that Dawson isn't actually interested in her. He was planted there to distract her so that Antony could weasel his way next to Edwina. Dawson tries to state his case that he actually is interested in Kate, but the damage is done. She quickly goes and finds her sister, who is still with Lumley and Antony, and tells Edwina, we're leaving. Right before they leave, she turns to Bridgerton and says, do not speak to me or my sister ever again. So it was a pretty drama-filled day for Antony. His brother, however, ah, his brother, however, Colin, is back in town, and he's chatting up Penelope because when he was away, she was really the only one that kept corresponding with him. She says to him that he must have been lonely on the trips. And he says, no, I was never alone. Before Penelope can even find out who he was with, Eloise runs up and grabs her. She has impeccable timing. Eloise thinks she's found a breakthrough in the 
Who is Lady Whistledown mystery? She found a pamphlet that looks an awful lot like the pamphlet from Whistledown. So now she's convinced that she's found the printer. Penelope, though, tries to get her off the case. It doesn't work. Eloise goes to that printer, and it's in the sketchy part of town. When she talks to somebody who works there, he blows her off. He tells her that he doesn't know who Whistledown is, and she needs to get lost. When she continues to ask who Whistledown is, he starts mocking her about the fact that she's after gossip. She tells him that his assumptions are completely wrong. She's not after Whistledown for the gossip, she's after Whistledown to make her a better writer. After all, Eloise is an intellect. So, the printer shows her exactly what he just printed. It's not a Lady Whistledown pamphlet. It's a women's rights pamphlet. So unfortunately for Eloise, it looks like the trail has gone cold. The next day, Lady Danbury, Edwina, and Kate get called to the Queen's palace. The Queen starts talking to Edwina about how difficult it truly is to be the diamond of the season. She's got to be ready for people to come at her with false intentions. She warns her about rumors, how dangerous they truly can be. What she wants from Edwina is when these people come looking for information, she wants Edwina to let her know. She never mentions the name Whistledown, but that's who this all is about. And when both the Queen and Lady Danbury tell both girls to go off and look at the grounds, she admits as much to Danbury. One of the big reasons why she made Edwina the diamond of the season is because of the fact that Edwina has no idea who Whistledown is. She's literally a clean slate. The Queen plans to use Edwina to find out who the true identity of Whistledown is. Around the same time, not too far away, Antony is fencing with his brothers and he's venting about the fact that Kate is all but blocking his chance at marrying her sister. Colin suggests maybe he just switch gears, find a new girl. But to Antony, finding a new girl is like admitting defeat. It's something he's not willing to do. At this point, it's not even about Edwina. It's about winning the battle between Antony and Kate. He decides to go visit Edwina, but he doesn't come empty-handed. He brings a gift, a grown-ass horse. As Edwina, Kate, Lady Mary, and Lady Danbury are talking about how they're going to have another soiree so Edwina can meet a couple more of her admirers, Kate looks outside and sees Antony and is able to get to him before Edwina. She yells at him, saying, Did I not make myself clear? I told you never to talk to us again. He tells her, You don't even know me. And while she doesn't know him personally, she feels like she knows who he is and his type. And it's not somebody she wants marrying her sister. He tells her, You do realize that every woman in London aspires for the kind of marriage that I'm offering, right? And the problem is, yes, Kate knows that, but she wants her cake and to eat it too. She knows that her sister needs to marry somebody of Antony's stature. But she also wants a love marriage for her sister. Having both? Uh, that's tough. Only a Daphne can do that. That doesn't mean that she's not going to search for that. Antony, though, tries to remind her that this isn't about her. It's about what her sister wants. And her sister breaks up the uncomfortable conversation. When she sees Antony's gift, though, she's less than thrilled. He thought a horse was a good idea because of what she mentioned at the races. The one horse reminding her of one from her childhood. But she tells him, that horse was in a book. She's nice about it, but it becomes clear to Antony that his gift didn't really go over all that well. Antony then heads home, and that night he's doing some work for the family. When he overhears his mother, his sister, and Colin leaving, he gets curious, and his mother says, yeah, we're going to the soiree. Did you not get your invitation? And Antony, of course, did not get an invitation. That was by design by Kate. Immediately, Antony takes it as an insult, and Lady Bridgerton goes and says, she is looking for a love match for her sister, and you, I mean, you've made it clear of your disdain for such a thing. Maybe you'll choose your words more wisely this time. They then head off to the soiree where it's become all but a talent show. It was supposed to be a poetry reading, but guys are just showing up and trying to flaunt their skills. But there's more of a lack thereof. Two women that are actually finding humor in the fact that none of these guys are all that talented are Kate and, surprisingly enough, Eloise. Even though Kate knows that Eloise is Antony's sister, because of the fact that Eloise holds herself as more fun, down-to-earth, doesn't have such a stick-up-her-ass like Antony does, Kate loves her. She actually says, I kind of think more about him now that I know he's related to you. There's a little bit of a lull in this talent show. And that's when Penelope walks up to Edwina and compliments her on her dress. Edwina returns the compliment. And at first, Penelope thinks that she's making fun of her because her dress is bright yellow. But Edwina makes it clear, no, I actually really do like it. The two don't talk for long because Penelope notices Colin Bridgerton. So she makes a beeline over to him. She needs to get her answer on who exactly Colin was spending his time with when he was traveling. And he says, you were right. I wasn't exactly lonely on my travels. I started a real conversation with somebody. Somebody I knew for a really long time, but 
After everything that happened with Miss Thompson, I realized I didn't know this person at all. Penelope, of course, thinks he's talking about her. No, he's talking about himself. And to make it worse for Penelope, he says, I have you to thank. Your letters were so encouraging, and I thought, if Penelope can see me this way, then why can't I see myself this way? He then reveals that he's sworn off women since the whole Miss Thompson situation. And when Penelope says, well, I'm a woman, he puts her in the friend zone, saying she doesn't count. You just got a feel for the yellow-dressed damsel. And while Penn was getting put in the friend zone, her mother was trying to dig for some dirt on the new Lord Featherington. She was trying to do it through Lady Cowper. Because the new Lord Featherington plans on marrying, and it's got Lady Featherington very paranoid. She thinks that whoever he marries, they're going to kick them out of their own house pretty quickly. She doesn't get much information, but she's definitely concerned. One person who has yet to arrive at the soiree is Antony. And that's because, one, he wasn't invited, but two, he needs his brother's help. He heads to Mondrich's club, where he knows Benedict is hanging out. And as Benedict is in mid-conversation with an artist, Antony demands that he come outside and help him. At first, he just wants help on how to read poetry. But as his brother is explaining poetry more and more, he throws out an off-the-cuff poem right from the top of his head. And it's great, so he has him write it down. He then heads off to the party where he does have stiff competition. I mean, Lumley is out here just throwing it down. Anthony is actually the last one to go. He showed up just in the nick of time. And while Kate doesn't want him to go, pretty much everybody else does, and he riles up the crowd enough to allow him to go. He starts to pass off Benedict's poem as his own, but he stops and says, I, I-, I can't do this. This isn't me. I could stand here and pretend to be something I'm not. I may not be able to offer the display of passion that you truly deserve, But I assure you that when it comes to action, I'll never be found lacking. And I would hope that would speak louder than any poem ever could. When Antony leaves, Kate tries to use what he said against him, saying, You hurt him, Edwina. He can't give you what you deserve. And Edwina shoots back, Does that make him a bad man or an honest one? Edwina then promptly walks up to Antony and starts chatting him up. For the first time, it seems like Edwina kind of did what she wanted to and not what Kate wanted her to do. Kate gets so annoyed that she has to walk away, and Lady Danbury notices it, so she goes to check on her. Kate starts bashing Antony to Lady Danbury, saying that she'll make sure of it, that Edwina never marries that guy. Danbury tries to give her some advice. When you try to do stuff like that, show people the light. It's annoying, and it never works. Kate doesn't really take that advice too well. She tells Danbury that she doesn't care what she thinks or anybody thinks, and as soon as Edwina's married, she's heading back home with vowing to never set foot in the city again. They start discussing how sad it is that Kate is content with being alone. Kate's saying that she's more content with knowing her sister will be taken care of. And when Kate brings up how content Lady Danbury is, Danbury gets offended, saying, I've lived a life. I'm a widow. I was in love. You aren't me. And if you continue down this road, you're never going to be. The next day, the latest edition of Whistledown comes out. As Penn and Eloise are hanging out, Eloise is reading it, and she notices that every single K is a little bit messed up. This is how Eloise plans on finding out who exactly Whistledown is, but since Penelope is hearing this, she knows she has to get the printer a new K in order to get Eloise completely off the scent. When she heads to the market and buys it, she ends up getting seen by the modiste, and she completely runs away in a panic. But the modiste is the least of her concerns, because the queen is on to her. She had her spies follow Edwina and see exactly who she was talking to. And it's not a long list, and Penelope is one of those girls. In episode three, the Bridgertons are planning on having their big party of the season. They have it every single year. They basically invite the entire town. And they have it at their summer home, Aubrey Hall. But before that, they decide to invite Edwina, Kate, and Lady Danbury just for a few days so that Edwina can get acquainted with the family. Edwina knows that this is a big weekend for her. If everything goes well, she'll be engaged when she leaves. But before they arrive, the Bridgertons all get together. That includes Daphne. Daphne has brought her newborn, Augie. And after she hands off Augie to her mom, she starts talking to Antony about how the season's going. He lets her know that things are going so well with one particular girl that he's invited her to the house for the weekend. She's great. Her sister, she sucks. Antony then tells all of his brothers and sisters that they're supposed to help him went over the hearts of not just Edwina, but also Kate as well, because she has such a big say in who Edwina marries. Daphne kind of chuckles and says, well, seeing as you were such a help to me in my season, how could I not help you out? They then get word that the carriage with Kate, Edwina, and Lady Danbury have arrived, and Danbury is first out. She's so excited to see her great godchild. 
Lady Mary and Lady Bridgerton then say hello to each other. But the first person that Antony talks to isn't Edwina, it's Kate. Antony notices that Kate has brought her dog, and Kate says, yes, Newton is an excellent judge of character. And that's because Newton is barking at Antony. He tells her, well, rest assured, by the end of the weekend, I'll have won you both over. They get interrupted when Daphne walks over and says, you must be Miss Edwina. And Antony is horrified. He lets her know, no, this is her sister Kate. Edwina then walks over, gets introduced to Daphne, and then everybody starts heading into the actual house. But right before they enter, Antony pulls his mother aside and says, I think I'm going to need the ring from you. Lady Bridgerton goes and gets it, but she wants to make sure her son is certain of his decision. She's worried that maybe Antony is rushing things and he should get to know Edwina before he makes such a big decision. He doesn't really need to do that. He knows that Edwina would make the perfect Viacountess. He also finds his mother amusing because she'd wanted him to marry for years, and now that he's ready to marry, she wants to make sure that he's got a, quote, clear mind. As those two are discussing his possible engagement, Daphne is outside showing Edwina and Kate around. Mainly, a game they all play called Pal Mal, which I'm just going to call a croquet. There's probably a difference, but I'm calling it croquet. Hit thumbs down for that editorial change. But this is a big tradition with the Bridgerton kids. They get together, they play this game, and it gets extremely heated. Daphne starts telling Edwina and Kate about everybody's strategies and what to look out for. They then all come out, and it's time to actually pick your mallet. They start arguing about what order you get to pick, and Daphne says, well, the only fair thing to do is let our guests pick first. Edwina picks hers, but when Kate picks the, quote, mallet of death, Everyone starts looking at each other because that is known as Antony's mallet. He is absolutely fuming, but he has to hold himself in a higher standard as not to turn off Edwina. Kate, however, sees right through it. She knows that it irks the Vi account. They then start the game. And as all the kids play, Lady Bridgerton and Lady Mary start talking about the children. But they also have another common bond. They're both widows. As they're getting acquainted with each other, Lady Danbury walks up, and both Lady Danbury and Lady Bridgerton start discussing their love match from the previous year, and how that was a success. And maybe this year's matchmaking will be an even bigger success, that of course being Antony and Edwina. And that's because Edwina is acing every single test that she's been given, although it's not like the family is putting her through the ringer or anything like that. Back over on the field of play, the group comes to a conundrum. Kate's ball is right next to Antony's. The rules state that you can try to bash your ball through the wicket, or you could hit an opponent's ball farther away from a wicket. Kate knows this, so she asks Antony, what should I do? Are you in a mood to lose? And Antony has to act like he won't be bothered if Kate hits his ball. So Kate smashes the crap out of it, through the woods, and now the only way he can continue to play is to go retrieve it. Edwina is then up next, and she hits her ball into a bush, but she doesn't really feel like playing anymore. The competitive nature of all the Bridgertons have kind of turned her off to the game, because in her words, this is just a game. So she bows out, telling Antony, have your fun, but I'm going to go back to the house and enjoy some refreshments. The next Bridgerton up is Colin, and unfortunately for Kate, Colin's ball is right next to Kate's, and he does the same thing Kate did. He smashes her ball right into the woods, the same woods, the same woods that Antony's ball was headed into. Now both Kate and Antony have to head into the woods to retrieve their balls, and it seems like Colin knew what he was doing when he did this. Both Kate and Antony are not happy about the situation, but they get even more pissed off when they see where their balls landed, a mud pit. Kate starts saying that they could pull the balls out and no one would be any the wiser, but Antony says, I would know. He feels like this may be one of Kate's tests to see his morality, and in fact, it was, because she admits that as soon as they got out of there, she would have told on him. Antony's a little hesitant to get in the mud, but Kate isn't. She ruins her shoes her dress. She gets right up in there and hits her ball out. Antony wants to save face, so he also gets in there, ruining his boots and hits his out. Antony's able to leave the mud with no problem, but Kate gets stuck. Antony reluctantly tries to help her out of the mud, but they both end up falling into it. At first, he's kind of pissed off, but then they just have a good laugh about it. When they finally climb out, all dirty and disgusting, Antony asks, what do I have to do to win your approval? And she explains that she's not doing it out of spite. She just wants to steer her sister to the best possible match. She thought that he would understand since he has sisters. He says, then let's put that behind us. Allow me to prove this weekend that I can provide your sister all the happiness she deserves. So they agree on a truce, but their balls are still right next to each other. And Kate hits his in an unfortunate location. She doesn't know it, but it's the location of his father's memorial. Because Aubrey Hall was where his father died. Of all things, a bee sting. 
That's right. His father was Macaulay Culkin from the hit 90s movie My Girl. No, this probably happens more than you think, but still. Yeah, so he died of a bee sting, and that's why Aubrey Hall has always been an emotional place for Anthony to go to. It's where he watched his father die, but it's also where he became the Viscount at the age of 18. So when Kate hit his ball over to the memorial that she can't see, he just stopped playing entirely. She eventually goes over to retrieve the ball and sees the memorial and feels like an idiot. Anthony heads inside, gets dressed in you know clean clothes, and then has a one-on-one with Edwina. It's not quite a one-on-one, though, because Lady Bridgerton and Lady Danbury are over in the corner eavesdropping. But the conversation between Edwina and Antony goes great. They really hit it off. They bond over their differences. The fact that Edwina loves to read and the fact that Antony doesn't. That night, as they're getting ready for bed, Edwina starts telling Kate all about how perfect Antony is. And when Kate starts bringing up how Antony must have just talked about himself the whole time, Edwina corrects her and says, no, he asked about me. He asked about my interests. He asked about the books I didn't read. It does make Kate think twice about her preconceived notions on Antony. They are unaware, by the way, that outside Lady Danbury is eavesdropping on the conversation. And right down the hall, Lady Bridgerton is doing the same thing to Antony and Daphne. But Daphne has the same questions that her mother did about Antony rushing into this relationship. She's worried that her brother isn't actually in love. They don't want to come right out and say that. So the way they word it is, well, you know, if you're sure, we just want to make sure you're making the right decision. But if she gives you that feeling, and Antony doesn't know what Daphne's talking about. So Daphne describes the feeling of when you burn for somebody. The more and more she describes it, the more Antony realizes he doesn't get that feeling with Edwina. But the fact is, he's not looking for a love match anyway. He's looking for someone to be comfortable with. So at the end of the day, that feeling that Daphne's describing doesn't matter to him. Outside of the room, Lady Danbury makes her way downstairs as Lady Bridgerton is walking away from the door. And Lady Danbury gives Lady Bridgerton the biggest cheesing smile. The next day, as Kate is having tea on the veranda, Eloise comes out to read. And since they have a good relationship, she confides in Eloise that she might have upset Antony during the game. And because of where the ball was, she knows it must have involved something with her father's grave. She explains to Kate that Antony doesn't really go there much at all. Eloise then returns Kate's question with a question of her own. Was it Kate's choice that she never got married? Because everybody tells her that you'd rather die than be a spinster, but then there's Kate, who seems completely content with her status. Kate explains that it is difficult because the world isn't accepting of an unmarried woman. Eloise says, well, that seems to be society's flaw, not a woman's. And that's something that they both agree on wholeheartedly. But it's ironic that the conversation about Antony avoiding his father's grave was even brought up. Because in that moment, he decided to go visit the grave for the first time in God knows how long. As he's staring at it, his mother walks up with some flowers to put at the base of it. His mother then sits him down by a bench because she can tell that she's being troubled by this decision. He should be happy, but he's not. He says, I'm fulfilling my duty to this family. And she says, well, your father did that, but he was also able to be in love. She thinks that deep down, Antony does want that, even though he says the exact opposite. He seemed to be on that track until his father died. Then a wall went up. And that's the issue. When Antony's father passed away, he had to deal with it. He was the new Viscount. His mother was able to grieve and mourn. And he tells her, you don't remember it, but I do. Antony never wants to feel that way again, thus he's not allowing himself to fall in love. He then walks off and they get ready for dinner. And everybody's there, including Colin and Benedict. And Benedict is tripping balls on something else. Colin brought back some powder that is some form of 1800s drug, and Benedict took a whole bunch of it, so he's in another world. He's acting a little out of hand, so in order to get everybody's mind off of what Benedict is doing, Lady Danbury and Lady Bridgerton say it's time for a toast, or if anybody else has any pressing matters, and what they're alluding to is Antony proposing. Antony stands up, and he's about to. He's making a speech, but then he looks over at Kate. Kate is not approving. When it comes time to actually ask the words, will you marry me, Antony doesn't. He makes up a quick excuse on the spot, acting as if this was never going to be the question, and it breaks Edwina's heart. That night as she's getting ready for bed, she cries to her sister that she must have done something wrong. And Kate is explaining to her that you did nothing wrong, and there'll be plenty of other guys. But Edwina's big concern is, when everybody shows up for the party in a couple days and they find out that they're not engaged, guys are going to start to wonder what's wrong with her. And she's never going to marry. The only thing Kate can do is try to console her sister and remind her that in the end of the day, she's the diamond of the season. Everybody's after her. 
While she is dealing with bad news, right down the hall, Benedict is getting some good news. One of the reasons why he took this hallucinogenic is because he's stressed out. He applied to an art school, and he needed to get his mind off things. The hallucinogenic definitely did that. But then he receives the acceptance letter, and he loses his mind. He freaks out in joy. As he's screaming out the window, Eloise mentions how Benedict is going to be as insufferable as Colin is, because Colin hasn't shut up about his journey since he's returned. She asks him, if it was so great in Greece, why didn't you stay? And then he reveals, it's because of Miss Thompson. He asks how she is and if Eloise ever hears from her, and Eloise corrects him and says, oh, you mean Miss Crane. Let's not forget, she's married. But she's also not far away. And that's one of the reasons why Colin returned. Miss Thompson has been living rent-free in his head. The next day, Antony is out by the garden, and Kate strolls up on a horse. She tells Antony that her sister isn't feeling quite well. And Antony tells her, I didn't mean to disappoint Edwina last night, but rest assured, she won't be disappointed for long. I still plan to propose. Last night just didn't feel right. They then start arguing about his decision, what he's doing, if he's toying with the emotions, and then he notices that a bee is flying around Kate. He freaks out. He tells her to stop, and she doesn't think anything of it because it's a bee. Even when the bee stings her, she doesn't think anything of it, but he starts hyperventilating. In order to calm him down, she grabs his hand and puts it to the bee sting, which is a little bit above her chest. She starts assuring him that he needs to calm down because it's only a bee sting, but their lips are getting closer and closer. They get super close to kissing until a horse neighing snaps them out of it. They then run away from each other and think about what they almost just did. But all of this was going down at Aubrey Hall. Back in town, the Featheringtons were dealing with an issue. Mrs. Featherington is definitely concerned that the new Lord Featherington is going to find a new woman and cast them out. So they need to stop that from happening. They start planning on finding a woman that is simply too dumb to get them out. And then she walks right in. It's Prudence. They explain to her that she will have to seduce the new Lord Featherington, which Penelope finds extremely gross because he's their cousin. But Lady Featherington starts selling it to her about how Prudence will be the new lady of the house. The whole time, though, she's just thinking about herself. But in order to seduce the new Lord Featherington, they're going to need new dresses. So they head to the Modiste. The problem is the Modiste starts making a dress that is normal. Mrs. Featherington wants to slutty up Prudence. The Modiste isn't really willing to do it, so they head across the street because there's a new Modiste in town. As Lady Featherington and Prudence leave, Penelope stays behind because she has to address what happened in the market. She starts kind of trying to explain why she was there, lying the entire time. But to her surprise, when she says, you might have seen me, the Modiste says, no, I don't recall. The Modiste can tell that Penelope is extremely uncomfortable with this conversation. She tells her a lady's business is only her own. She then leaves the Modiste and head over to meet with her mother and her sister. Later that day, Operation Banging Your Cousin is a full go. Lady Featherton is even teaching Prudence how to attract him. Doesn't really work, though. When Lord Featherington walks in, he doesn't pay them any mind. Lady Featherington tries to get Prudence involved in the conversation, but she fails because she's an idiot. As he's leaving the room, he mentions to Lady Featherington how he's going to invite Cressida and her mother over for dinner, which Lady Featherington wants no parts of, but she doesn't have a choice. So the dinner is set up, and it is awkward. Lady Cowper is making the case for Cressida to marry Lord Featherington, and Cressida is doing a really good job of selling herself. All the while, though, Lady Featherington, on the other side of the table, is trying to insert prudence into the conversation. And that doesn't work. Lord Featherington asks Cressida if she wants to hang out the next day. The next day, a new edition of Whistledown comes out. And there's not a whole lot of gossip, other than the fact that there's a new Modiste in town, and everybody is flooding to her shop to get dresses, which is leaving the Modiste that we know and love on the outside. She's losing business. This was even brought up at the dinner by the Calpers, how the old Modiste dresses were simply that, old, tired. So in the latest edition of Whistledown, she points out that Cressida Calper looks horrible in the new outfits. And while Madame Delacroix's dresses might be old, they're timeless. As the Modiste is reading this, in walks Penelope. She explains to her that it is her job to be observant, but also to hide secrets, and she's really good at that. At this point, they both know what Penelope's secret is. But keeping that secret is becoming more and more difficult. Penelope knows that it's only a matter of time before somebody else catches her at the market, and they're not as quiet as Madame Delacroix. That's why she thinks that they can work together. Madame Delacroix helping her get the Whistledown pamphlets out. 
in return, Whistledown is going to write glowing things about Madame Delacroix. And it's already working. Two women come into the store, and they need assistance. So now we have a partnership. In episode four, the Bridgertons are getting ready to host their annual Hearts and Flowers Ball. Just about every single family is invited to the soiree. Obviously, the shawarmas are invited, but they're already there. Edwina is feeling a lot better. She thinks she realized why Antony did not propose to her. It's because of Kate. She's noticed that Kate hasn't been quite herself since the bee sting, and Kate starts thinking, maybe she's on to me. Maybe she knows what me and Antony almost did. But Kate is definitely surprised when Edwina says, he hasn't married me yet because of you and your relationship with him. You guys hate each other. So she begs her sister to help her get that proposal. They, along with the Bridgertons, wait for everybody to arrive. The families all arrive, and it is customary for Lady Bridgerton to greet them all one by one. And as she's doing so, Daphne is right by her side. But Daphne can't help but mention to her mother that she's concerned her brother is making a rash decision. Daphne doesn't feel like Antony really knows Edwina at all. So if Antony isn't going to get to know Edwina, Daphne will on his behalf. One of the people that Daphne and Lady Bridgerton do not greet is Penelope. She's in great spirits ever since coming to an agreement with Madame Delacroix. Madame Delacroix has been able to use her skill set to get Penelope's words to the printer, doing so hiding them in a dress that's delivered to him. The only issue they have is the printing apprentice, a guy named Theo, who, by the way, is the same guy who put Eloise in her place, finds it weird that the printer is getting a dress delivered to him and sees the printer pull out the paper. But, hey, for the time being, everything's going great. Penelope runs up to Eloise and Colin and finds out, though, that Eloise is still on the hunt for Whistledown. But it's a little bit of a mixture of both. Yes, Eloise does want to find out who Whistledown is, but she took the paper that Theo gave her about women's rights, and she loves it. She's been following it along. It's a real radical movement in the time. But as Penelope is making the case that the printer is not connected to Whistledown, she gets more concerned because it seems like Eloise is getting a little too cozy with this printing apprentice, Theo. Not too far away as Edwina is talking to Antony, Kate walks out and gets called over to the table by Edwina. It's pretty awkward interaction between Kate and Antony. After Edwina tries to force some small talk out, Edwina brings up how Kate and Antony should hang out. And Antony brings up how he's busy. He's going shooting with the other guys. When Edwina brings up how Kate is an excellent shot and Antony scoffs at it, Kate, who doesn't want to hang out with Antony, takes offense to it, saying, what, you don't believe me? And the answer is no, Antony doesn't. He thinks that maybe Kate aims straight in the field, but when it comes to actually killing animals, she would fail. And you can't blame him. The fact is, a lot of women that time don't hunt. But because Antony is so dismissive, Kate bullies her way into going. She's the only woman to go on this hunt. And during the hunt, Kate notices that the animal tracks are leading in a completely different direction than the hunt is heading. She mentions it to Antony, but Antony blows it aside, saying, we'll follow everybody else. The more they go deeper in the woods, though, the more empty-handed they're coming up. They're not finding any animals. It gets to the point where Kate decides, screw this, I'm doing this thing on my own, and walks off. Antony, not wanting anything to happen to her, follows her. And it seems like Kate is onto something because she hears a deer not too far away. She gets in position to shoot it, and as Antony is yelling at her, he notices that she's holding the gun incorrectly. He goes to fix it. They get super close. They once again come close to kissing, and then it gets interrupted when the rest of the hunt says, oh, there you are. And they have to act like none of that ever took place. They then continue on with the hunt with the rest of the group. As they're trying to kill some deer, Edwina, Daphne, Lady Mary, and Lady Danbury are busy playing cards. The more Edwina talks about what she wants in a match, though, the more Daphne realizes that's not Antony. Edwina then tells Daphne about her plan to get Kate and Antony to like each other. She truly thinks this is a perfect plan. While those women are playing cards, everybody else is playing some sort of activity. That includes Lady Featherington and Prudence. Lady Featherington tells her daughter that she has one more chance to seduce Cousin Jack before everybody starts calling Cressida Cowper the new lady of the house. She really tries to hammer home the point that this weekend is huge for them. Now, one person who is absent from this is Colin. Because as soon as Colin found out that Miss Thompson lived not too far away, he planned a trip out there. When he arrives, he sees the cold, hard reality. Miss Thompson is holding her baby, Oliver. They get caught up. Everything seems to be going okay. But then Miss Thompson's husband shows up. Now, Colin has one foot out the door. He's ready to leave. But when the topic of Greece gets brought up, Colin gets all chatty. 
Turns out that Miss Thompson's new husband, Lord Crane, has some books and drawings on botany from Greece. So he says, you must stay. Have dinner with us. Marina tries to say, Colin probably has to get back. But Colin says, no, I've got nothing to get back to. And does end up staying. Looking at the drawings and really hitting it off with Lord Crane. When it actually does come time for Colin to leave, though, Crane gives Marina and Colin the time alone together to say their goodbyes. And Marina calls Colin out on his actions, saying, So you just showed up here to befriend my husband? Why did you come? And Colin tells her that he came to apologize. He didn't like how he ended things with the two, and he's forgiven her. But she tells him, You don't need to do either. You don't need to apologize for me, and you certainly don't need to forgive me, because I don't seek that. But the real thing that Marina tells Colin is to get over it. He's super focused on the past that she thinks that he can't look ahead to the future. Because that's something that she has done. She's content with her life. She never thinks about what could have been. That's the past. As Colin is leaving, Marina tells him, There are those in your life that you already make happy. You have your family. You have Penelope. And Colin says, Penelope? Marina tells him, Seek those people out because your future will not be in the past with me. He then is forced to head home, alone. And he's not the only one who arrives back late at night. So does Kate and the rest of the hunting group. As soon as she enters the room, Edwina starts grilling her on how it went. And Kate doesn't want to get into details, so just to shut her sister up, she tells her, I think it went well. She never once mentions the close call, but it does keep her up at night. Well, that and the thunderstorm outside. She can't sleep, and she decides to go into the library and start looking at books. But Antony, who also couldn't sleep, was walking by the room, saw the light on, and popped in. He walks up to her and says, you know, these books were my father's most cherished possessions. She then asks, how did he die? And he looks at her and says, a bee sting. And she feels horrible. He starts talking about how difficult it was for him to see his father, a great man, get humbled by such a small creature. But then he starts giving her that look. You know that look. And he starts getting closer with that look. And she's returning that look with her own look. They get snapped out of it, though, when thunder strikes, and they both go back to their rooms. The next day, the Bridgertons and their staff continue to get ready for the party. That includes Daphne and her mother. And Daphne starts telling Lady Bridgerton how great Edwina is. She knows what to say. She knows how to stand. She knows all of that. But the fact is, Daphne always imagined Antony was somebody more like himself. Edwina is nearly perfect, but at the end of the day, Antony is a Bridgerton. And Bridgerton's like challenges. Edwina isn't that. So after talking to her mother... Daphne decides to go talk to her brother about the situation. But when she starts to pry and point out that they don't really have anything in common, he basically tells her to mind her own business. They then all get ready for that night's party. When Edwina does show up, Antony takes her for her first dance, but she's not the only one who's going to be dancing because Lady Bridgerton is hell-bent on getting Eloise a husband. She invited this random guy that Eloise has no interest in dancing with, but she goes along with it. He starts asking her questions, but... When she shows even a hint of intellectual ability, he says, how about we get out of here and, you know, go spike the punch bowl. And she's so turned off by him that she ends up walking off the dance floor, which is a horrendous look for not just him, but also for her mother. When her mother tries to step in, Eloise stands up to her, telling her, I know I'm a disappointment to you, but just let me take my leave and go to bed. But Lady Bridgerton is not the only mother that's meddling. So is Lady Featherington. She instructs Prudence to go wait in the orange room. And then she walks up and interrupts a conversation between the new Lord Featherington and Cressida, telling the new Lord Featherington that there's a guy looking for him in that room and he wants to talk to him about business or something. She then waits a little bit and escorts a trove of people to that room where they catch the new Lord Featherington and Prudence alone. This is completely taboo. Lady Featherington acts mortified. She makes it out to be like the new Lord Featherington was making moves on Prudence. Even though he wasn't, he denies it. But since there are witnesses, Prudence is now bound to him. And he knows exactly what Lady Featherington was up to. He knows that she planned this all along. And so does Penelope. She tries to talk to Prudence about the situation. Prudence doesn't think it's a big deal. So what? The guy got conned. In fact, the only thing she cares about is Lady Whistledown writing about it in her new pamphlet. Penelope tries to explain to her that if Whistledown writes the full story, it won't just ruin Prudence, it'll ruin the entire family. They could be run out of town. But Prudence thinks that this is just Penelope being jealous that Prudence will be in Whistledown and Penelope won't. She has no idea she's actually talking to the real Lady Whistledown. 
And Prudis does have a good point, even if it's by mistake. How would Whistledown even know? She has no idea, but she's basically calling Lady Whistledown's bluff. As Cousin Jack is getting scammed back out on the dance floor, things are going great between Antony and Edwina. They've danced twice, which is a really good sign for Edwina. But Edwina wants Kate to dance with Antony because she figures that Antony is going to want to ask Kate's blessing if he's going to propose. Kate doesn't want to dance with Antony because things have gotten really awkward with the two lately, but she's all but forced to. So the two head out on the dance floor, and Antony does ask for permission, but Kate asks, well, can you make her happy? Antony doesn't say a word, and Kate points out, your silence is speaking volumes. Are you starting to reconsider? And Antony poses the question, is that what you want? You want me to reconsider? Kate then reveals that it doesn't matter what she wants because she's returning to India the moment that Edwina marries. And this is coming as shocking news to Antony. And he doesn't take it well. Kate explains that this was the plan all along, but the way that Antony looks at it, it's as if Kate is abandoning her sister. He ends up storming off the dance floor, and Edwina goes and questions her sister on what the hell just happened. Kate has to act like she has no idea, but she goes and tracks down the Vi account immediately to have a further conversation about this. She finds Antony in his father's library, stewing over it. He can't believe that she's going to leave, not even concerning herself with finding a match of her own. And she can't understand why he cares about that. The conversation then weirdly segues into why Kate doesn't like Antony. But then they start giving each other that look. You know that look. And they get closer and closer. And they're about to kiss until Daphne walks in. And it's not a good look for the two. Although Daphne can commiserate because Antony did the same thing to her last season. He races after Daphne to explain that wasn't what it looks like. They first get into an argument about the difference between the situation that Daphne just witnessed and the situation that Daphne found herself in a year ago. The difference in Anthony's eyes is the fact that he's a guy. Finally, Daphne has had enough. She can't keep quiet. And she points out that it's obvious to her that Anthony has a thing for Kate. She begs him to just be honest with himself. And she even goes so far as to use the L word, love. He looks at her nods and says then I know what I must do the next day everybody gets ready to leave but before the Featheringtons head off Lord Featherington lets Lady Featherington know that her plan is a bust he plans on marrying Prudence just as he promised and just as Lady Featherington wanted it but she should know that Prudence is marrying a penniless man he had talked about all these diamond mines that he had in America but in reality those were complete and total bust when Lady Featherington says, you paid for Philippa's dowry, he says, yeah, with a promise of a ruby necklace. I have no money. The only way to keep this family afloat was to marry into money. Somebody like Cressida Cowper. So, way to go. While those two are having a private conversation in a room, on the outside of that room, Penelope runs into Colin. They start talking about his meeting with Marina, and maybe this could finally be the opportunity that Colin needs to move on. And Colin tells Penelope... Even though Marina said she was content, I just can't shake the feeling that if Whistledown didn't write her gossip, things may have turned out differently for her. But I guess there is no use on dwelling of the past, so I will focus on the future. He then leaves. And so does everybody. Edwina and Kate are about to get in their carriage, and Edwina is saying, we did everything we could to get this engagement, but I guess it wasn't meant to be. And Kate, having been pressured by... Lady Danbury the previous night to tell Edwina about the fact that she needs to marry into wealth is about to. But then Antony runs out, gets down on one knee, and pops the question. Edwina excitedly says, yes. In episode five, Antony and Edwina get the queen's blessing to have the wedding, but she demands that they have it at the castle. Someone like Antony Bridgerton marrying her diamond, that's a huge deal. Antony thanks the queen, but also tells her that's not necessary. What also isn't necessary is that look that Kate keeps giving Antony. That my mind is telling me no, but my body, my body is telling me yes. But the real reason why the queen wants to have it at the castle is because she wants to finally figure out who Whistledown is. If it's at the castle, then that's the biggest story going on in town. She'll have all of the girls that she's come to the conclusion could be Whistledown followed. And they're even planning on putting out false rumors to see which ones come back. But that's not the only wedding that's going down. You also have the wedding between the new Lord Featherington and Prudence, which is stressing Lady Featherington out. She's once again broke. 
She's facing having to fire the same people that she just rehired. And when Cousin Jack walks in the door, he says, you have no one to blame but yourself. If it wasn't for you, we'd be living comfortably on Cressida's dowry right now. But you had to meddle. If you would just call this ridiculous engagement off, we could salvage it. But Lady Featherington tells him no. I can't do that to Prudence. It would break her heart and her reputation's already been ruined. It's far too late for that. So it's back to the drawing board. He's got to think of something. Down the street, the Bridgertons are getting ready for a dinner that night with the Schwarmas and Lady Danbury to welcome them into the family. When Lady Bridgerton brings up to Eloise that she's going to need her help, Eloise says, Sorry, Mom, I can't. I'm attending a lecture tonight. She doesn't want to tell her that it's an intellectual lecture on women's rights, so she tells her that it's about floral arrangements, claiming that Lady Featherington is forcing Penelope to go, so she's going to keep Penelope company. In reality, she's planning to go solo. A couple of rooms down the hall, Antony, along with the jeweler, are waiting for Edwina and Lady Mary to arrive. They're supposed to go over ring sizing, but the two women are running late at the Modiste. Kate went ahead because she wanted to go and have a conversation with Antony about why he is proceeding to go along with this, especially after what happened at Aubrey Hall. But Antony reminds her, nothing happened at Aubrey Hall. Yes, something almost happened, but almost is still nothing when you look at it. The conversation is a little awkward, but it gets even more awkward when the jeweler asks if she has the same sized hands as her sister, which she does. So with Edwina running late, the jeweler puts Edwina's ring on Kate's hand. And when Edwina and Lady Mary do finally show up, there's Kate wearing Edwina's wedding ring. It's really only uncomfortable for Kate because she knows what her and Antony are currently going through. Edwina is too clueless to realize. As Kate is trying to get the ring off, Lady Danbury walks in and tells them that she's received word from Edwina's grandparents that they're in town and they want to come to the dinner that night. Edwina is thrilled. She's never met her grandparents. Kate and Lady Mary, on the other hand, they're not looking forward to that at all. Because of this news, Lady Mary is suddenly not feeling well. There's a little bit of a party in a park, but she no longer wants to go. Neither does Kate, but Lady Danbury all but makes her. And on the walk over, Kate asks Danbury, how could you invite them? You know what they did to my mother. And Danbury says, I do. That's why I'm not going to answer their impoliteness with impoliteness. Besides, isn't this what you wanted? Edwina to be in the good graces of the Sheffield family? Reclaiming the fortune you so desperately need? And Kate admits, that is what I want, but not until after the wedding. That's because Edwina is still in the dark about everything. And Kate also knows that if the Bridgertons were to learn about this, they might feel a certain way. And Danbury looks at her and says, I kind of think that you'd like that if the wedding got called off. Kate tries to play dumb with Lady Danbury, but Lady Danbury's too smart. She reminds Kate that they're engaged. In the eyes of society and the Queen of England, they're as good as man and wife. Only an amazing scandal would prevent this marriage from going down. And a scandal like that would send alarms through the entire town. It could be a stain from which the Sharma family would never recover from. Only a fool would jeopardize the marriage. So in a nutshell, Lady Danbury tells her, back off, Edwina got there first. Right at the end of this conversation, Mr. Dawsett walks up. He wants to make amends with Kate. He does find her attractive, even if he was sent by Antony at the races. He asks Kate if she wants to go around the lake with him, and when Kate says, I'm rather tired, Danbury says, oh no, she'd be delighted to. Both Dawson and Kate walk right by Antony, Lady Bridgerton, and Edwina on their way to the lake. And while Lady Bridgerton and Edwina think it's great that Kate is finding somebody, Antony cannot take his eyes off of him. He's sending daggers at Dawson, as if to say, like, get away from my girl. He stares them down their entire lap around the lake. And while Kate didn't want to go, she ends up having a really good conversation with Dawson. Even when Kate mentions how she's planning on going back to India, Dawson seems more than willing to go with her. But when the two arrive back on the dock, it is Antony who is waiting there for Kate to help her out of the boat. Their hands, however, are holding for an uncomfortably long period of time. When Antony realizes it, he steps backwards, he trips over Newton, and takes him and Dawson into the lake. It's quite embarrassing. Not too far away, one of Antony's friends, Mondrich, arrives along with his wife, and Mondrich does not want to be there at all. He wants to be back at his gentleman's club running things, but his wife reminds him, we need gentlemen to be in the gentleman's club, and they're all here, so you need to network. The problem that Mondrich has is he's still known as just a boxer. At least, that's what Cousin Jack knows him as. As soon as Mondrich walks up, Jack introduces himself, but then immediately goes into Mondrich's boxing career. It kind of pisses Mondrich off, and it's his wife who actually has to invite Cousin Jack 
over to the gentleman's club, which he appreciates the invitation. But then Lady Featherington walks over and pulls him away from it. She starts chastising him for not finding a solution to their problem yet and just chatting it up with guys at gentlemen's clubs. And he returns it by saying that she continues to run up massive bills at the Modiste, so maybe she should start thinking of an idea herself. Now, two people that aren't there are Benedict, who is at school, and Eloise. She went off to that lecture. When she gets there, she's like a kid in a candy shop. She's overwhelmed, looking all over the place, but then she sees a familiar face. It's Theo, the printing apprentice. She walks up to him, and he's pretty surprised that she's there. They start busting each other's chops, but it's all in good nature. It seems like they're getting along quite well. Penelope, though, didn't go. And that's because Penelope wasn't invited. She found out that Eloise was going to this lecture from a conversation with Colin, and she wants to get to the bottom of exactly what Eloise is doing because she's concerned that Eloise is tracking down exactly who Whistledown is. She heads on over to the Bridgerton household where Eloise tells her, Oh, I'm sorry, I can't go on our walk today. So on her way out, she asks one of the maids where Eloise went, and the maid gives her the address. She then heads home, where her mother has called for the jeweler. Jeweler is checking out a ruby necklace, and when Cousin Jack walks in, he gets very uncomfortable because he knows that it's fake. He's kind of pressuring Lady Featherington to stop, but the jeweler continues to appraise it. And the jeweler gives it the all clear. He believes that it's real. When he leaves, Cousin Jack walks up to Lady Featherington and says, What are you doing? Those stones are fake. And Lady Featherington says, exactly, if we just fooled that guy, we just might make it out of this season. This conniving idea turns Jack on a little bit. He's into it. Now, right before that night's dinner at the Danbury household, Lady Bridgerton has to have a conversation with Antony. The way he's acting, it's as if he's going to get his taxes done and not getting married. He tries to let her know that the love match between her and his father was the exception, not the rule. But she wants him to experience love. She feels like he's making a mistake. And she tells him, if you think you are, then you have to call it off now. But he says to his mother, what I want isn't important. I can't back off now. I couldn't do that to Edwina. And she says, you're correct. You can't. You're a gentleman. But a woman could. I mean, it happens all the time. Women get cold feet. If Edwina were to call off the engagement, nobody would find fault with her. You wouldn't be dishonoring her. It's a win-win. He, however, looks up at his mother and lets her know that she doesn't want to end the engagement. And she asks him, does Edwina know your true feelings on the matter? Even though both people in the room know that this is a mistake, Antony is dead set on going through with it. In the other room, the soon-to-be bride is also getting prepared for that night's dinner, and she's excited, not just to meet her grandparents, but also for the idea that she will be the Viscountess. Her sister is not all that excited. She just wants to get the hell out of town and forget all of this went down. But with Edwina's grandparents moments away from it arriving, Kate feels like this should be a good time to tell Edwina the truth. The problem is, she's out of time. Right before she can tell Edwina, Lady Danbury comes in to let them both know that the Sheffields are downstairs. They head downstairs and the Sheffields greet their granddaughter and they act like they didn't abandon the entire family. Kate, they completely ignore. They also treat Lady Mary like an outcast. It gets even worse at dinner. When they start talking about estates and what they like to do, somehow Lady Sheffield spins it to start bashing Lady Mary and start bashing Kate's mother. It gets extremely awkward. Lady Bridgerton and Lady Danbury see what's going on, so they try to get the conversation moved elsewhere, but it doesn't work. Lady Sheffield cannot harbor her resentment for her own daughter embarrassing them years ago. And it gets to the point where Lady Mary can't take it anymore and fights back. When Lady Sheffield brings up that they were robbed of having their granddaughter for years, Lady Mary says, you have two granddaughters and you had every opportunity to spend time with them. You didn't. I was cast out by the only family I had ever known. But you know what I learned? I learned that you actually did us a favor because when you cast me out, you taught me that I could raise my daughters far from your constant judgment and demands that they should chase wealth over love. We don't need your wealth. And Lady Sheffield cracks up at that statement, knowing the agreement she made with Kate. Problem is, nobody else other than the Sheffields and Lady Danbury know about that agreement. This is coming as a complete surprise to Lady Mary, Edwina, and the Bridgertons. When Lady Sheffield continues to go in on Lady Mary and Kate, Antony steps up to the plate and says, I've had enough. You have failed to show the proper respect for the Sharma family, and I'm not going to stand for it. Lady Mary has done an amazing job raising her daughters. They're eloquent, they're kind, loyal, and a credit to both of their parents. And since you clearly don't wish to jeopardize your social standing, I suggest you leave and don't bother waiting for an invitation to the wedding. You're not getting one. He kicks the Sheffields out, but he's also pissed off. 
So is Lady Bridgerton. They also feel like they've been duped. And they take off. Kate runs after Antony to explain that Edwina had no idea. And he says, that became obvious. This was all you. Now we just have to call off this wedding. Nobody needs the headaches involved with this. But I won't call off the wedding. That would do Edwina a disservice. So Lady Danbury and my mother will come up with a plan. And Kate cuts in and says, there will be no plan. What did she do to you? Why does she deserve this? And Antony says, she doesn't. It's you. He starts telling Kate how he never wants to see her again, how there's no point in the world that could be far away that would suffice. But the more that he's telling her how much he hates her, the closer the two are getting. They come really close to kissing. Neither of them asked for this, but they both clearly want it. Antony, though, is a total tease. He steps back and reminds Kate that if he weds Edwina, it would bind him and Kate for eternity. And he's going to spend every day wanting Kate, dreaming of Kate. Eventually, he knows he's going to give in a temptation. He then gets the hell out of there. So it was not exactly a pleasant dinner party. But hey, it was at least a party, which is something that the Featheringtons weren't even invited to. Their mailbox is empty, which is unheard of for them. They're a well-respected family in the community. Lady Featherington goes to complain to Cousin Jack about this. But the conversation, though, goes from how they have no plans to the business that Lord Cowper wanted with Jack. It all has to do with these ruby mines. But the problem is those ruby mines are worthless. There's nothing in them. And Lady Featherington says, take his money. He doesn't know that. Get them to invest. Our fortune will be restored. Prudence will have a great wedding. And I won't have to suffer the disdain of this town again. Once again, Jack's liking this conniving style from Lady Featherington. Late that night, down the street, Edwina can't sleep. She's too annoyed. Kate comes in to apologize and explain her side of things. Edwina's annoyed, but she does tell Kate that they don't need the Sheffield's money. When she marries Antony, she's going to have plenty of it. And she knows that Antony will take care of Kate as well. Kate doesn't want that, but the more that Edwina talks, the more that Kate realizes it's not going to be easy to talk her out of this engagement. She really is in love with Antony. The next morning, Kate goes on one of her horseback rides, and to her surprise, Antony shows up. He lets Kate know that he's decided he's going to talk to Edwina and find a way to end things that day. When the engagement's off, him and Kate are never going to see each other ever again. Kate starts sticking up for her sister, and Antony's taken back because Kate's been against this marriage from the start. And Kate yells, I was wrong. I'm not going to be the cause for you losing your honor any more than I'm going to stand for Edwina being in pain. You once saw her as your perfect match, you will find your way there again. You have to marry my sister because this feeling that plagues us, it's going to pass. Before you know it, it'll be as if we never felt it at all. After hearing this impassioned speech, Antony agrees to go along with the wedding. And lastly, we have our first sex of the season, and it's Benedict. He ends up having sex with a nude model at school. Good for him. She is attractive. In episode six, the queen gets ready to host that wedding. The only real big concern she has is that the king's wing gets locked. She doesn't want anyone finding their way in there and seeing him in such a sad state. She's also convinced that this day will be the day that she finally finds out who Whistledown is. But one person is getting nervous. That's Edwina. The closer it comes to wedding day, the more she's realizing that maybe the Viscount isn't into her as much as she's into him. One of the things that she points to is the fact that the Viscount doesn't really look at her very long. But Kate and Lady Mary end up talking her out of it, saying, that's ridiculous, don't read too much into it. To Antony, though, this is nothing more than fulfilling his duty. The whole town is getting ready to attend this wedding, including the Featheringtons. And this is going to be step one in Lady Featherington's scheme to con just about everybody out of their money. Prudence is going to wear one of Cousin Jack's fake ruby necklaces. Since she already kind of brings a lot of attention upon herself, she's going to tell everybody where she got that necklace. That should lead to a bunch of husbands and guys at the wedding to find their way to Cousin Jack and want to invest. When Lady Featherington explains this to Cousin Jack, He all but admits that he has a thing for her, which is a little bit awkward since he's planning on marrying her daughter. Penelope is also planning to attend the wedding, but first, she has to talk to the Modiste. She calls for the Modiste to meet her at the Featherington household, which is a risk because there's no reason for the Modiste to be there. She's not delivering a dress. She starts asking the Modiste what exactly she knows about Theo Sharp, but the Modiste doesn't know anything. And it's such a curious question that the Modiste starts to get concerned that there's something bigger involved. And she can't risk that for her business. Penelope reassures her that there is nothing bigger. And when Lady Featherington comes down and sees that the Modiste is at her house, the Modiste is forced to come up with an excuse on why she's there and head on out. Now it's just time to get married. Antony is at the Bridgerton household and he's all ready to go. Edwina is at the castle getting dressed. 
Everybody shows up at the castle, including Lady Danbury, who walks up to Lady Bridgerton and makes mention of the fact that they haven't talked since their awkward dinner with the Sheffields. These two women were once friends, and Lady Bridgerton points out, there's no reason for us to talk. It's not like you'd reveal any late secrets that you might have. Lady Bridgerton's still pretty pissed off, and she does blame Lady Danbury because Lady Danbury did know about the secret. As soon as Penelope shows up, she goes and finds Eloise, and they start comparing weddings between this one and last year's with Daphne. This segues into a conversation about Whistledown and how much power she has, and when Penelope points out that Whistledown writes about everybody, Eloise says, no, she doesn't. I mean, there are people outside of the town that deserve attention too. And Penelope grabs her to the side and says, are you speaking of Theo? Are you still seeing him? And while Eloise knows about Penelope's warning, and she does know that it'd be foolish for her to continue to see Theo, she's continued to do so anyway. She does reassure Penelope, though, that it's only his thoughts that she's interested in, which is something that I hear constantly from women. Upstairs, Benedict is helping Antony get ready, but that's when Daphne walks in. Daphne knows that Antony's making a mistake, and Antony says, we can't turn back now, it's too late in the process, and it would ruin not only her family, but ours as well. But Daphne didn't come here to talk about Edwina, Daphne came here to talk about Kate. It's obvious to most women that see the two interact that there's something going on between the two. Antony assures Daphne that they both have decided nothing can go on between the two. The conversation turns pretty contentious when Daphne brings up their father and how much Antony has changed since his death. Daphne pointing out that he can choose to be happy and Antony bringing up the fact that he's not going to give in a love. It ends with Daphne telling him that she mourns for him because the things that he does that he thinks will bring him respect actually make the entire family pity him. This is just yet another decision that makes them pity him. Now it's just time to make the walk down the aisle. But as the priest is saying the vows, it comes time for Antony to repeat them. But Antony isn't listening to the priest because he can't stop staring at Kate. It's something that Edwina notices. That's the look that she was talking about. The look that the Viscount does not give her. It finally all clicks for Edwina and she runs out of the room yelling, I need a moment. For the time being, the wedding is put on pause as Lady Mary and Kate chase after Edwina to find out what the hell is going on. But as Lady Mary is trying to de-escalate the situation and calm Edwina down, Edwina has had enough. She yells, I want the truth. I can't believe you. All this time, you had feelings for him and you wanted him for yourself. Edwina feels like this is yet another lie by her sister. She finally asks Kate, do you love him? And Kate doesn't say a word. Lady Mary takes Edwina out of the room to get away from it all. But before she leaves, Lady Mary does yell at Kate for keeping so much from her. Kate ends up going and hiding in a closet and crying. The Bridgerton family heads to another room in the castle, thinking that Edwina will eventually come to her senses. The only one who's not real assured of that is Eloise, who says that maybe Edwina just realized that marriage is a prison. But it's Benedict who points out that maybe just Antony needs to be left alone. Now, this is pretty embarrassing for the queen as well. She's the one hosting this wedding. She doesn't always do that. So she calls Lady Danbury into a private room to have a conversation with her about what exactly is happening. The big concern for the queen isn't the fact that these two aren't going to get married. She doesn't really care about that. It's more of the look of the queen's diamond of the season getting cold feet in her palace. And what Lady Whistledown will eventually write, which is blaming the queen. When Danbury starts pointing out that maybe they're in a situation that can't be salvaged, the queen says, it better be salvaged. You vouched for this family. I never would have thought of making Edwina the Diamond of the Season had it not been for you. This is much your fault as it is anyone's. Danbury says that she'll go find Edwina and figure out something. And in the meantime, the Queen instructs the guards to not let anyone leave. The nuptials will continue to go on shortly. So all of the wedding guests head out to the garden for the time being. And rumors are swirling among the guests on what they just witnessed. And this scandal could be exactly what the Featheringtons need. With everybody outside, they just need to redirect everybody's attention to Prudence, which isn't going to be easy. So Lady Featherington goes over and instructs Prudence to go and show it off. Lord Featherington does his part. It doesn't take long for those men to find their way to Lord Featherington. He starts pitching them about these ruby mines, but there's one man that is a little hesitant to buy into this scheme, and it's Mondrich. You can't blame him. He's weary of anyone with the Featherington name after what happened last season. Both Mondrich and Featherington end up trading subtle insults back and forth until eventually Featherington just excused himself from the conversation. He did so because Lady Featherington wanted to talk to him. She wants an update on if he's come to any agreements, and the answer is no, but he's close. And she tries to put his feet to the fire because they may never have a situation quite like this again. The whole town is out there. She's also realized that what they need to do is focus on people who aren't real beloved in the town. 
That way, when the money doesn't roll in like they're expecting, it won't be that big of a deal. Nobody will think poorly of them. Lord Featherton asks, who makes that list? And it's basically everybody but the Bridgertons. Jack starts once again hitting on Lady Featherington. He's attracted to her because he feels like he just met the female version of himself. That they could be partners, but also partners in another way. The other Featherington, Penelope, gets found by Eloise, who has been thinking about their conversation earlier in the day. Eloise did think that the bond that she had with Theo was just intellectual, but now she's thinking maybe it's more than that. She needs to find out what Theo feels in the situation. Penelope thinks this is a terrible idea for many reasons, but also warns Eloise of what happened to Lady Mary when she married, quote, beneath her. Eloise shoots back, I'm not talking about marriage, Pen. I just want to know. When Penelope pressures Eloise on why she has to know, Eloise says, I can accept certain mysteries, but this one, I can actually find out yes or no. The not knowing is torment. So at the behest of her best friend, Eloise does end up sneaking out of that party because she figures no one's going to notice I'm not here anyway and heading to go see Theo. She gently poses the question to Theo, Dad, do you think about me? I mean, because sometimes I think about you. And the answer to that question is yes. Theo goes inside the printing press and has a bunch of books waiting for her. He tells her, I thought you might like these. Eloise is completely unaware, though, that one of the king's men followed her there and is watching her every move. Back in the castle, though, Antony feels like it's best if he goes and has a conversation with Edwina. But Edwina says, please tell me you're not going to come in here and tell me more lies. So he more pitches her on the roles that they have in society and how they simply just align for this marriage. He doesn't care about the lack of a dowry. He doesn't care about the insults of the Sheffields. But he also can't say yes when she asks, is that because you love me? He continues to try to pitch Edwina on why they should continue to go on with the marriage. And eventually Edwina has to ask, what role is Kate going to play in all this? He tells her she's going to have no place in our future. Once we marry, she's returning to India. She tells Anthony, I'm going to need a little more time to think about what I want to do. As Antony is leaving the room that Edwina's in, he runs into Kate. Kate doesn't really want to talk to him, but Antony follows her into the closet. He asks Kate to do something to salvage this wedding. And Kate tells him there's not a lot she can do at this point. Edwina has simply figured everything out. But she does go and have a conversation with Edwina, apologizing for everything, admitting that at one point she did have feelings for the Vi account, but that doesn't matter anymore. Kate basically makes the same pitch to Edwina as Antony made. You deserve this. And what Edwina can't figure out is, why doesn't Kate deserve this? Those two are clearly in love. And the reason that Kate gives is the fact that she's been working towards this her entire life. Finding Edwina a match, making Edwina happy before she thinks of herself. In a way, her lack of being selfish has made her selfish. The conversation and apology attempt from Kate does not go over well. Edwina even brings up the fact that they're not sisters. They're half-sisters. She ends the conversation by saying, if I go through with this wedding, it'll have nothing to do with you but she still needs more time. The apology that Kate gave to Edwina isn't the only apology that goes down that day. With everybody kind of in a holding pattern, Lady Danbury ends up running into Lady Bridgerton and apologizing for what happened at the dinner. But these two are old friends, and it doesn't take long for them to rekindle their friendship and actually have a good laugh about the situation. They're both in a crappy spot. You might as well laugh about it. The two women then go and talk to the Queen, but the Queen is steadfast that this wedding better be going down. And the problem is, Neither Danbury or Bridgerton have an answer on that. As they're telling the Queen that it is Edwina's decision, Edwina comes in, and they start trying to do what Danbury and Bridgerton were doing. Kiss the Queen's ass, thanking her profusely, but the Queen is sick of it. She just wants the question answered. Are they getting married or not? Before Edwina can even answer, the King runs into the room. Everybody is shocked to see him. No one more so than the Queen. He starts talking about how he's late for the ceremony and starts apologizing to the Queen for being late. He's clearly confused, and when the queen asks a bunch of her men to help the king back into his chambers, he gets really upset. That's when Edwina steps in. Edwina thinks that the king thinks it's his wedding day, so she starts telling him that the queen is going to make an excellent queen, but for now, it's probably best that he rest. This works. He goes back into his chambers and closes the door. Everybody then leaves the room, and shortly after that, both Antony and Kate receive word that they're to meet in the same room that Antony was to marry Edwina in. With Kate, Edwina, and Antony in the same room together, she tells Antony that she can't marry him because Antony can't provide her with what she deserves. She then turns her attention to her sister, criticizing her for sticking with this notion that Kate has sacrificed her own happiness for Edwina's because Edwina has her own life. Kate shouldn't use Edwina as an excuse on why she isn't happy. Edwina then leaves the room, and it's just Kate and Antony. Kate doesn't want to leave, but eventually she has to. 
She says her goodbyes, and then finally, after six freaking episodes, the two end up kissing. Took you long enough. In episode seven, the post-wedding whistle-down edition comes out, and just like the queen had predicted, it sort of blames her for it. But one of the issues that she points out is the fact that neither the Schwarmers or the Bridgertons have made an official statement on the matter. It's leading everybody to make their own conclusions. Anthony and Kate are both having trouble sleeping, and Edwina is still heartbroken. Even the Bridgerton kids can't help but joke around about the situation. This is all behind Anthony's back, though. When he finally does come downstairs, his mother says that we have to act swiftly. Basically, we have to act like nothing's wrong with us. That way, we can save face. Her solution? To head to the promenade as one, a family united. Antony's okay with it, and Eloise says, I'll meet you guys there. I have to go shopping. But when she heads outside, there's a carriage waiting for her. It's the Queen's. After one of the Queen's men caught her going to a printing press, the Queen is now pretty certain that Eloise Bridgerton is Lady Whistledown. So she has a private conversation with Eloise in her carriage. She goes through all the reasons why she convinced that Eloise is Lady Whistledown, including the fact that last season... She'd hired Eloise to find the identity of Whistledown, and she came up empty. All of the evidence is pretty damning, but it's more so unfortunate because obviously Eloise isn't Whistledown. Eloise pleads this case to the Queen, but she doesn't want to hear it. She tells Eloise, you know, Lady Whistledown could be a real asset to the Queen. But when Eloise says, I would love to, man, but I don't hold that power, the Queen points out what a miserable life she really could hold for Eloise. Especially if the Queen were to reveal that it was Eloise Bridgerton, because people would then seek revenge on Lady Whistledown. She points out that if the Bridgerton situation now seems bad, it would only get worse. She gives Eloise three days to consider her offer, and if Eloise doesn't, quote, come to her senses, she's going to squash her like a bug. Eloise is petrified. She knows that she's not Whistledown, but she doesn't have hard evidence. While Eloise was getting interrogated by the Queen, the rest of the Bridgertons headed to the promenade, as did the Sharmas. And both families are having the same issue. They're trying to play it off like nothing's wrong, everything's okay, they simply had an amicable parting of the ways, but everybody that they try to talk to completely ignores them. Lady Featherington takes this opportunity to fire some shots at the Bridgertons, pointing out that she knows how Lady Bridgerton feels after what happened between Colin and Marina last season. The more and more that the Bridgertons and the Sharmas walk around the promenade, the more it becomes clear they don't have many allies. It causes both families to have a meeting post-promenade. The idea that they come up with is hosting a ball. There's no better opportunity for both families to show that there's nothing bad between them than hosting a ball together. It also gives Edwina the chance to find another suitor. Edwina says, well, a ball would work. I mean... Lord Bridgerton and my sister were really good at hiding their feelings for each other. I'm sure they can do it a little bit longer. But then Newton runs in. Both Kate and Antony tend to the dog, but then they can't stop staring at each other. Edwina sees it and says, Was I really that blind? Yeah, girl. Yeah, you were. But this is more of a serious issue. Danbury suggests that both Kate and Antony stay on opposite sides of the room. And Lady Bridgerton makes mention of the fact that the only people that know about Kate and Antony are the people in that room. They want to keep it that way. So it wasn't a joke. They really do have to stay away from each other at this ball. When they get home, Lady Bridgerton asks Antony if the plan is going to be a problem for him, and he says no. But then she points out that they still have an issue. He still has nobody that he's supposed to marry. He asks her, you do realize I'm not the only Bridgerton boy, right? And when she asks, is this your plan to let your brothers marry before you? He freaks out, yelling, is this it? Do you want me to admit I made a mistake? I realize I failed. This plan will work. I'm sure you and Lady Danbury will make certain of it. But if you thought Antony was freaking out, it doesn't even compare to Eloise. She needs to talk to somebody about the situation, and who else but her best friend, Penelope. When Penelope hears about the Queen and the conversation that she had with Eloise, now Penelope's freaking out too, but for completely different reasons. Eloise's main concern isn't even herself. It's Theo. She doesn't want to get him in trouble. She feels like if the Queen saw her talk to him, then she might think that Theo has something to do with this. When Eloise mentions that she has to go warn him, Penelope says, no, you don't. That's crazy. You should stay far away from him. What you should do is wait for Lady Whistledown to print her next issue. That way the Queen will know that you had nothing to do with it. But now with the information she has, Penelope also has to talk to somebody. And the person she goes and talks to is the Modiste. When the Modiste hears about it, she starts freaking out like the other two. 
Nobody's higher than the queen. And the agreement that she had with Penelope didn't mention anything about the queen. Penelope simply doesn't know what to do. It's not even like she can turn herself in. She doesn't know that the queen would actually believe her. She might think that it's just a friend trying to help another friend. Penelope then notices the modiste has a bunch of pictures up, and she tells Penn that she was planning on submit them to a revered house of dressmakers in France. Now with this going on, she doesn't know if that's such a good idea. Penelope promises that she will not sully the name of the modiste. That's when the modiste has an idea. She realizes the one thing a lady would never do is sully her own name. All Penelope has to do is write something about Eloise that she would never write about herself. If it's convincing enough, the queen will believe it. But in doing so, Penelope knows that she could be ruining her friend. She doesn't want to do that. The next day, the Bridgertons and the Shawarmas head to an art exhibit as a united front, once again trying to prove to the entire town that there's nothing wrong with them. It still doesn't work. Every room they enter in, the art isn't the main attraction. They are. It's pretty awkward, but as Lady Bridgerton mentions, if we can put the wedding behind us, so can these people. To further prove that there's no bad blood between the two families, Antony takes Lady Mary around the exhibit, and he uses this chance to apologize to Lady Mary, saying, I just want to assure you, I had no intentions of ever hurting Edwina. Lady Mary tells Antony she can't blame him for all of this. She has to take some blame herself. When her husband died, it should have been her that was handling the books, not Kate. She put Kate in a tough spot. Antony ends his conversation with Lady Mary and runs into Kate. He has to talk to her covertly. Kate really isn't in the mood to talk. She just gotten done talking to Edwina, and that conversation did not go well. Edwina let her know that everybody is swallowing the story, that they decided to call off the wedding amicably, but she still isn't ready to forgive her sister. So when Antony comes over to talk, she's not interested. Antony brings up the fact that they kissed, and she says, We didn't. You are bound to my sister. There's no world where we could kiss. The fact is, we did a terrible thing. We should be ashamed of what we did. One family who is noticeably absent from the museum is the Featheringtons. That's because Jack Featherington has spent his day at Mondrich's Gentleman's Club, which is empty. But just because it's empty doesn't mean Mondrich is going to kiss Featherington's ass. He still is bitter about what happened with the previous Lord Featherington. And the conversation between Mondrich and Jack gets contentious when Jack all but brings that up. He was looking into his cousin's old files, and he saw some peculiar transactions to Mondrich. Jack's message to Mondrich is clear. I don't need to tell your secrets if you don't tell mine. Keep your mouth shut about the rubies. If you think my ventures are suspect, don't tell anybody. He then heads home. As Penelope is trying to think of exactly what to write about Eloise in her next edition of Whistledown, she ever hears a familiar voice down the hall, and it's Colin. She walks out and is surprised to see Colin in conversation with Cousin Jack. Turns out that Colin is thinking about investing in Jack's ruby mines. Colin turns his attention from Jack to Penelope, and then when Lady Featherington comes downstairs and says, Oh, I didn't know we had a caller. Colin makes it very clear that he's not there to court Penelope, and he leaves. But when Lady Featherington finds out exactly what Colin was up to, she goes and has a conversation with Jack about the situation because she told Jack to stay away from the Bridgertons. Jack's excuse is that Colin is so eager to invest, he had to basically take the meeting. They then both get the invitation to the Bridgerton Ball. And down the street, that is exactly what the Bridgertons are focused on, at least Lady Bridgerton. Most of the kids don't want to go through this farce. Eloise, on the other hand, is just hyper-focused on the latest edition of Whistledown. She's not had a good day. She had that awful meeting with the Queen. She talked to Penelope and defied her suggestion not to go talk to Theo. She did so to warn him, but it backfired. Theo didn't want to talk to her and basically dumped her. So when Penelope shows up later that day to the Bridgerton household, Eloise is relieved because she has to talk to her. She's decided that she is going to accept the Queen's offer and admit that she is whistled down. She'll just put out a counterfeit paper and own it. When Penelope brings up Theo's name, Eloise says, I don't want to speak his name ever again. I'm not doing this for him. I'm doing it for my family. Penelope asks her what's going to happen when the real Lady Whistledown decides to publish. But Eloise is done caring about the real Lady Whistledown. She's got two days to consider the Queen's offer. In Eloise's mind, this will give her more time to find the real writer. She then thanks Penelope for being a loyal friend and heads to get ready for that night's ball. But Penelope is in knots because the latest edition of Whistledown is coming out. Eloise just doesn't know what's in it. That night, the Bridgertons, the Sharmas, Lady Danbury, they all congregate in the Bridgerton household, and they are the only ones there. Antony's not going to waste that night. They've got a band after all. He's going to dance. And everybody has fun dancing with each other. 
For one song, it's like a wedding was never called off. But then they find out exactly why nobody showed up to their ball. Because the latest edition of Whistledown has come out, and it does not speak well of Eloise. The drama that Whistledown wrote about was that Eloise was going to the bad neighborhoods, unchaperoned, and talking to radicals. Eloise is sick to her stomach. So is Penelope, because she knows what she did. Her mother is thrilled. She no longer cares about the Bridgerton social standing. She instructs Jack to seal the agreement with Colin. So the Bridgerton ball is a bust. And even after having fun dancing with each other, Edwina is still not ready to forgive Kate. Kate heads out to the garden, but she's quickly joined by Anthony. I'm going to save you a lot of the drama here. They start fighting. They get closer. They don't kiss this time, though. They bang each other's brains out. Something about that garden gets people crazy horny. They even fall asleep in it, which is dangerous because anyone could find them. But when Anthony wakes up, he's alone. That's because Kate ran back home. But she has Antony's lap hog right on her mind. That thrust game was on point. And after sullying her, Antony knows what he has to do. He has to propose. He grabs his mother's ring, heads on over to Lady Danbury's house, waits for Kate, but he's told that she isn't there. And he figures that she must be off riding. It doesn't take him long to quickly find her. He chases after her. But it's poor riding conditions. It's raining out. And when Kate goes to jump over some logs, the horse doesn't. The horse bucks up and throws Kate off where Kate hits her head and is knocked out unconscious. And in episode 8, Antony picks up Kate and rushes her back to the house. The doctor immediately starts tending, but Antony is beside himself. That's because he truly loves Kate and he doesn't know if she's going to be alright or not. To make matters worse, he feels like it's his fault that she's lying there. So he ends up storming out of the house. Days later, Kate still has not woken up. And neither has Lady Whistledown. She hasn't written since her previous post about Eloise. To quote Penelope, Lady Whistledown is done ruining the lives of others. And Penelope wants to go visit her friend. She wants to see how she's doing. But Lady Featherington tells her, you are not to step foot in that household. She then gets an update from Lord Featherington about how close the deal with Colin is. It's very close. Because of this, Lady Featherington wants to throw a big celebration. She's going to throw a ball. And she's going to call it the Featherington Ball. Very creative. She's going to invite the entire town, including the Bridgertons and the Sharmas. She figures, worst case scenario, they don't show up. Best case scenario, they do. And the drama will ensue. Down the street, a ball is the farthest thing on the Bridgertons' mind. Lady Bridgerton continues to send flowers to Kate's bedside. But then Anthony walks in the room like a tornado. That's because he was recently doing the books and saw that Colin took out a sizable amount of money forces Colin to admit that he is thinking about doing an investment with Lord Featherington. Antony flips out, and when Eloise and Benedict come to Colin's defense, he insults them. He basically insults everybody in the room until eventually they all get up and leave. Everybody except his mother. She's worried about him. He has yet to visit Kate. And while he says he doesn't have the time, she thinks he should make time. Later that day, the Bridgertons get a package delivered to him, but it's surprisingly for Eloise. When Eloise opens it up, it's books. And there's a handwritten note inside from Theo. He admits in the note that he knew that Lady Whistledown was using the printing shop to print her pamphlets. And that pisses off Eloise. She covertly heads to the printing press, but Theo explains, I couldn't tell you. I didn't know she was still watching me, but she's taking her business elsewhere. I didn't want to end things with you, but I also didn't want her to see the two of us together. I thought if she did, she'd write cruelly of you, which Eloise points out. A little late for that. Eloise doesn't really care about apologies from Theo. She wants to know who Whistledown is, so she tells him, I want to know everything you know. He tells her the manuscripts came twice a week and they were sewn in silks. There's only one person that could possibly be, and it's the modiste. After leaving the printing press, she heads to go visit with Madame Delacroix. She accuses her of working with Whistledown, and Madame Delacroix is taken off guard but also denies it, knowing full well that Eloise doesn't really have any hard evidence. It is making Madame Delacroix extremely uncomfortable, though. Luckily for her, the conversation is interrupted when the Featheringtons walk in. But when Penelope sees Eloise talking with Madame Delacroix, she has an idea of what it could be about. She pulls Eloise outside, where Eloise tells Penelope that the print shop where Theo worked was where Whistledown printed her pamphlets. She is positive that she is well on her way to finding the true identity of Whistledown. Penelope then reveals to Eloise that there has been gossip of her talking to Theo for weeks. Eloise Bridgerton, a man from the lower class, 
And by Lady Whistledown not writing, she's doing Eloise a favor. All of this takes Eloise completely off guard because she thought she was being discreet. Penelope tells Eloise that she is sick of hearing about Whistledown because Eloise has been obsessed. She has to move on. But this plea is more so in hopes that Eloise does move on. So she doesn't find out that Lady Whistledown is her. She doesn't listen. That night, she heads to the printing press, and along with Theo, she starts combing over documents looking for any clues that could lead her to the true identity of Whistledown. When a bunch of papers fall, the two get down and pick them up, but they get really close to each other. Eloise doesn't know quite what to do, so she tells Theo, this whole thing, we can't do this. We can't meet like this anymore. He reminds her that this was her idea, and as she's packing up all of the Whistledown letters, She starts apologizing to him for wasting his time. He asks her, are you? Or are you dropping out of this for other reasons? She tells Theo that people are already talking about them. And because of that, she has to leave. She couldn't live with herself if Theo was the one who had to face the consequences of their relationship. Theo doesn't take it well. He says, it's okay. You dipped your toes into my waters trying to make yourself feel better about the advantages of your birth. Now you can go back to your life and I can go back to mine. You hate to see young love end so soon. But the lack of Whistledown's pamphlets are leaving the town thirsty for information and gossip. Mainly, the queen. She calls Lady Danbury because she is curious as to why the wedding didn't take place. Danbury, however, tells the queen, I'm not sure. We're all just worried about Kate at the moment. But if Lady Whistledown were currently writing, she might be writing about the scheme that is going on with the Featheringtons. Okay, probably not because that would affect Penelope Featherington, but I needed a segue. This is it. That night, Lord Featherington meets up with Colin at Mondrich's Gentleman's Club to seal the deal. Even though his wife tells him don't get involved, Mondrich can't help himself. He knows that Featherington is running a scheme, and he wants to warn Colin about it. He tells Colin, this dude is a swindler. It's a trait that he shares with his cousin. I got wrapped up in it, and I'm not proud of it, but I don't want you to. But to Mondrich's surprise, Colin stands up and defends the Featheringtons, telling Mondrich that he should mind his own business, and this is probably why he has nobody in his gentleman's club. And then, he tells Featherington, let's take our business elsewhere. After further talks, Lord Featherington comes home victorious. He bursts through Lady Featherington's bedroom door and says, Colin Bridgerton is taking the bait. But there is an issue. He tells Lady Featherington, we've basically exhausted the entire town, and eventually, they're going to want some return on their investment. We're not going to have it. We should think about heading back to the Americas. Lady Featherington has no interest in that whatsoever, but Lord Featherington sells it to her that she could be the Queen of America. They then get dangerously close to kissing until Lord Featherington actually pulls away. And it seems like he's leaving Lady Featherington wanting a little bit more. The next day, with Edwina by her side, Kate finally wakes up. At this point, Edwina has forgiven her sister for what happened. A close call with death will do that. When Kate wakes up, Edwina is beside herself in glee. They let her know that Lord Bridgerton was the one who rescued her. But when she asks, has he visited me since, they have to say, no, he hasn't. Word of Kate waking up quickly spreads throughout the town, and Lady Bridgerton rushes in to tell her son. As soon as Antony finds out that Kate is okay, he starts crying. He is so relieved. Then Lady Bridgerton starts crying because she starts apologizing to Antony for the fact that it was he who was with his father the day that he died. And it was he who had to look after the family while she was in mourning. When there's a lull in the conversation, Antony tells his mother, I don't know if I can go visit her. And Lady Bridgerton tells her son, losing your father was the toughest moment of my life. But I take solace in knowing that I would still marry him every single day of the week. I would feel the same pain I felt all over again just to spend five minutes with him. That is real, true love. Do not lose her, Antony. So Antony heads on over. After they get some pleasantries out of the way, he tells her that that morning he showed up looking to propose. He then pulls out the ring, but to his surprise, she says, I'm returning to India. The moment I figure stuff out with Edwina, I'm gone. Lady Danbury has offered to sponsor my mother and my sister for another season. To become clear, I'm no help. He tells her that she's running away, and she tells him to go. The next morning, Kate actually makes it out of bed. The first person she goes to visit is Edwina. She tells her, I know that earning back your trust isn't going to be easy, but I'm willing to try. Edwina then starts asking the tough questions to Kate about Kate and Antony's relationship. And Kate is honest with her. She wasn't lying to Edwina. She was lying to herself. 
Both women then agree to go to the Featherington Ball that night. But later in the night, Kay starts getting cold feet. She doesn't even know if she wants to go. And when Lady Mary walks into her room and Kay tells her, I don't know if I'm going to this thing, Lady Mary says, I really hope that's not because you want to flee from what's difficult. I know this feeling. It's never the wise choice. Kate starts crying and Lady Mary reminds her, Edwina forgave you. I forgave you. But Kate cuts her off and says, I didn't forgive myself. The conversation goes into what burden Kate had to deal with as Lady Mary was grieving her husband. And Lady Mary points out that was your father. You had already lost your mother. This prompts Kate to mention that Lady Mary took her in and treated her no different than Edwina. She felt like she owed her. And Lady Mary says, you owed me nothing. You never had to earn your place in this family. I loved you from the day I met you. And love is not something that is owed. You came into my life as a daughter, and I never saw you as anything else. It makes me sad to think that you think that you don't deserve love in this world. Kate then tells Lady Mary about Antony coming and proposing to her that day. She says, I couldn't say yes. He was asking me out of mere obligation after the two of us, but she stops herself. Kate tells her mother, I don't think he loves me. Both women are crying and they give each other a hug. And Benedict has returned home for that ball. But it's not just for that reason. He found out that Antony had made a sizable donation to the art school on his behalf. And that's what got him in, not his merit. He got so mad that he left school. The first person he sees when he gets home is a very sad Eloise Bridgerton. She looks like she went through heartbreak. So Benedict sits by her side. He reveals to his sister why he left the academy. And she tells him, that doesn't mean that you wouldn't have been accepted on your own. She tells her brother that she really doesn't want to go to this ball. So Benedict says, I'll escort you. Back in the house upstairs, Anthony is just sitting with his thoughts about what went down that day when Gregory walks in. He had a tough day with his Latin teacher, but then he notices a painting of his father. And he tells Anthony that he didn't even know his father. That causes him to ask Anthony, what was the father like? And Anthony is telling Gregory all about their dad while they unknowingly are getting eavesdropped by their mother. A little while later, everybody heads off to the ball, and this is a big ball that the Featheringtons are throwing. The queen even arrives. It gets a little awkward when Eloise shows up and finds Penelope. They don't really know what to talk about, but eventually Eloise reveals to Penelope that she was right about Theo. It was a mistake ever getting involved with him. She thanks Penn for being a really good friend. But then Penn pulls her aside and starts pointing out all of the gossipy things that she's witnessed that night. And Eloise recognizes the words. It's at that moment that Eloise has figured out who Lady Whistledown is. But she doesn't call her friend on it right away. She needs proof. So she covertly heads up to her bedroom and starts looking for it. While Eloise is looking for the proof she needs, the Sharmas show up. And they start dancing like nobody's watching. Two other people who are dancing with each other are Colin and Cressida. Cressida is wearing one of Jack's ruby necklaces that he gifted her. And Colin says, there's a problem with it. Your clasp is broken. All right, I'll fix it. He then goes over and grabs Penn, and they go into a separate room. And they're alone, so it's very taboo. He tells Penelope, I've looked into your cousin, and I think he's a scam artist. Before he can even explain himself, Lady and Lord Featherington come through the door and demand to know what is going on. But Colin isn't going to let Lady Featherington guilt trip him into a marriage like she did with Lord Featherington and Prudence. He puts down the necklace and smashes it, proving that it's nothing more than glass. He calls Lord Featherington out on the fact that he's running a scam and demands that he return all the money. But the one thing he doesn't do is blame the Featherington women. Because the one thing that Colin has wrong is the fact that Lord Featherington is, quote, taking advantage of them because they don't have a father or a husband to protect them. Colin and Penelope then leave the room. And once they do, Lord Featherington tells Lady Featherington, the money is packed. We got to leave for America tonight. She asks him, what am I going to do about my daughters? And he says, we'll send for them after, or they can come with us. But in some ways, this will be a relief. I'm not going to have to go through my proposed marriage to Prudence. There'll be other possibilities. And then he kisses her. Outside on the dance floor, Penelope and Colin are dancing their little hearts out. Penelope is absolutely swooning over Colin. And when Colin tells her, I'll always look after you, Penn. You are special to me. She's about ready to jump into bed with him right then and there. She is riding high. She heads up to her room with the biggest cheesing smile on her face, but it quickly vanishes when she opens up her door to see that her place has been ransacked, and there's Eloise Bridgerton. She's found the whistle-down notes, and she's found all the money. She feels completely betrayed. Penelope has no choice but to admit to it, but it's hard to really sell to your friend. The reason why you wrote those nasty things in the last edition of Whistledown was to protect her. 
The two women say some things to each other that they'll probably want back. And Eloise leaves Penelope crying. Eloise heads back downstairs to the ball where Edwina and Kate find themselves on the sidelines. And Kate cannot take her eyes off of Antony. Edwina says, you're not going to be able to avoid him all night. And you shouldn't try to. Not on my behalf. She all but pushes her sister into Bridgerton's arms. Antony starts talking about maybe they should keep their distance, but she says, maybe I shouldn't. So they start dancing to a classical version of Wrecking Ball, which is an all-time banger. But everybody is basically staring at them. It's quite scandalous, which is something that Lady Cowper mentions. People near the Queen start asking if that's why Edwina had abandoned Antony on her wedding day. And without Lady Whistledown writing anything, the Queen lies, saying, Oh, no, child, that wedding didn't take place because I didn't want it to. Edwina then does her part, steps forward and says, I think they look beautiful. And the Queen agrees. She then looks Edwina up and down and asks, Have I told you about my nephew? He's a prince. So there might be still hope for Edwina yet. When the song is over, the Queen walks by the two, gives an approving nod, But then everybody has to head out because there's more entertainment outside. Fireworks. But when the entire place is cleared out, Lord Featherington turns to Lady Featherington and says, this is great, let's go. But she says, no. I've had the help pack your bags and I've given you enough money to get to the States. So here's how this is going to work. You're going to leave and we're going to say that we were scammed. You took everybody's money and you ran. We keep our dignity, but we get rid of you. This completely takes Lord Featherington off guard. After all, they were a team. But she points out no one's going to believe that Lord Featherington needed a woman's help to construct this master plan. And she already has a team. It's her three daughters. Lady Featherington is going to survive on the rest of the money they scammed everybody out of. It's a perfect plan. Lord Featherington knows it. He has no choice but to leave. She also had Farley forge his signature on a document stating that as soon as one of her girls has a son, the estate is going to pass to him. So score one for Lady Featherington. One of those three daughters is having a tough night and it's about to get more difficult for her. Penelope heads out in the garden and she overhears a bunch of the guys laughing and that includes Colin. Lord Fife tells Colin, I saw you dancing with Penelope Featherington. Is there anything there? And she overhears Colin say, no, I would never dream of courting Penelope Featherington. Not in your wildest fantasies would I do that. So she lost her best friend and she lost the love of her life. After the ball, Colin has something to do, though. He needs to make amends. He brings all of his buddies over to Mondrich's Gentleman's Club and apologizes to Mondrich for how he acted, but explains that he needed to do so to earn Lord Featherington's trust. To show a debt of gratitude, he told all of his buddies that this is a place that is run by an honorable man. His brothers, though, are still back at the party. Benedict walks up to Antony before the fireworks set off, and he tells him, I left the academy. I found out what you did. You were trying to help, but it was misguided. You sense the truth, which is I'm simply not good enough. Antony cuts him off and says, Benedict, you're beginning to sound like me. If you want to paint, paint. It's one of your many talents. Another one is you're able to see what people need before they see it themselves. He's talking about his relationship with Kate. Benedict saw it long ago. He thanks his brother for trying to show him the light, but he is unable to return the favor. Benedict does end up leaving the academy. Antony then goes off and tries to find Kate. He asks her if she's still planning to leave for India, and the answer to that is yes. He makes the pitch that she should marry him, and at first she fights it, but eventually she gives in. They share a lovely kiss under the fireworks, and not too long later, they're man and wife enjoying another rousing game of croquet, or whatever the hell you want to call it. And that is the end of Bridgerton Season 2. Thank you so much for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you like this. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought this sucked. If you leave a comment in the comment section and I don't get back to it, don't take it personally. I usually avoid the comment section because when people point out that one mistake that you made, i.e. forgetting the one Bridgerton daughter that never shows up in the show, it just pisses me off. So I just avoid it at all costs. But I do appreciate you stopping by. Also, I have merch. Go buy a t-shirt. I have bills to pay.